them as attendees and need to move them in. Right. But um, if we don't actually have a uh, a quorum, I think we just hang out for a little while. So did did the instructions change at all from the link? Here. Did the instructions change at all from the link um, that was on the meeting page? I mean, if if the if an applicant is trying trying to access the meeting the link through the meeting page. It's still accurate there, right? They're going to be attendees. They're going right. to. Okay. Okay. We've got some coming in now. Yeah. Did you start the meeting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Robert, you're good to go. Okay. So we've got Lauren. Um, Lauren is uh, an attendee that needs to be moved in. Mm -hmm. I did that. I can't see, uh, Denny, I can't seem to ask the question. Oh, okay. It says no open questions, but. Oh, because you're a panelist, maybe, maybe it can only be asked by an attendee. I'll, uh... I can move you to attendee, Denny. Well, okay. All right. Why don't you do that for a second? There's Joseph. Joseph has written an email. Um, I keep getting kicked out of the meeting. I thought I was in for a minute, but it keeps rejecting me. Um, I'm going to tell him to um, try to just enter on the city website as an attendee. So, Mary, I, I use your link and it signs me in as Mary. I love it. Oh, <laughs> I wonder if it's because um, you may have you may have used my personal link or whatever. I don't. I, I used the link that was on that email. It said it should have looked like this. That was a. Um, I can start signing out because I've used this before, just in another meeting earlier this, this week. Uh, but that was a link that popped me in was Mary Heverling. So. Okay. Well, I'll rename you. I'm trying to change my name. I've done that once before on here. I'm just making it change my name. We're just waiting to get a quorum here before we officially kick off. Mary, did you move me into uh, an attendee for a moment? Yes, or not? I haven't yet. Um, I'm not. There you go. Got my right name. Cool. Oh, I think I have to do a couple of things here. Okay, I just did it, Denny. Denny, I can see you. If he can hear me. Whoops. I answered a question, I think. Oh, it's from Andrew T. Mary, I screwed up. No, no, under the question in the Q&A? Yeah, I'll answer it. Okay, thank you.
Okay, I'm, I'm going to answer the my own question right now. I, I hope no open questions. Huh. I see them. Can you see the questions? Mm -hmm. Can you answer the question? Um, to say we're not, we won't be taking questions. You need to testify if you want to comment. Mm -hmm. um, I had recently made Joseph a panelist, but he doesn't seem to be moving over. Let me check my email again. I suggested that he come in through the, was he an attendee for a moment? Yes. Okay. For the audience, we don't have a quorum yet. We're struggling to get the fourth planning commissioner into the meeting. Says it, it, it keeps rejecting him mm. back again in the attendee list. Is he using the password? Well, no, he's, he's actually an attendee right now with his hand raised. So we're going to try to, uh, Mary will try to bring him in. Just try to bring him in right now. Who has what sounds like a washing machine going on in their background? It may be it the AC here at City Hall. Okay. Might be feedback. It might be your own washing machine. I don't hear anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't good. He should have been in by now with the, perhaps he, perhaps, um, Should I resend him the link? Yeah. Or I could, if you can do it right away. Yeah, that'd be good. Right. Sorry, everybody. We practiced today, but, um, we didn't practice with every one of the commissioners. We, staff and uh, Chair Massey were there. Can you tell Joseph that I just resent him the link? Okay. Um, we have a, um, we have a phone call, call in listener. I wonder if we should just check and see if, uh, the phone call listener is is Joseph by chance. I don't know. Are you, you going to move the listener in? Uh, you can't do that on uh, phone calls. Is there a way to um, open the listener and just see who that is? No. Mm -hmm. No. I mean, I can allow them to talk if they want. That's what I was wondering. Um, and then we're going to have community members be calling in, so it could be. Uh, it could be, but let's just find out. It might be Joseph. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Hello. Hello. I, uh, this is not Joseph. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks. We're going to put you back sure. into the attendee list. Um, we're waiting. For, we're waiting for our fourth commissioner. We're trying to get uh, so to have a quorum. So we're struggling right at the moment. So we're going to put it's you back. Not a in, okay. Thanks. 
Um, I'm going to do the email back to Joseph again. up again i used my cell phone with that same link mm -hmm. and it allowed me to connect with that link through my cell phone okay so maybe he should use his cell phone well if he can't get online if he has the link available on his cell phone uh you can access this via a cell phone also it, it, just a suggestion if he's having trouble with his pc i'm i'm um I just said I'm sending him that message right now. Okay. Well, if we stall long enough, John Henry may be uh, may be free. Um, Joseph wrote back. Huh. Maybe he should log out and log back in. Yeah, I don't know. It just says his message, he's getting a message that says. You are unable to rejoin this meeting because you were previously removed by the host. Hmm. Okay, we'll tell him to use the link that we just sent him. Okay. You mean, did you just send him a new link a minute ago? Well, the one about five minutes ago. Okay. Oh, look. I see Joseph popping in here, connected to audio. Yeah, I think maybe he might have used my personal link. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I'm on my phone now, so this is... Okay, well, uh, sorry about that. This is a challenge. Oh. Uh, okay. Well, um... Um... Chair Massey, I think it's up to you now to, to kick this off as a regular meeting. I need to unmute myself. Yeah. So, uh, good evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order and welcome you to the regular meeting of the Milwaukee Planning Commission. Sorry for the delay. Uh, as we had a few um, technical speed bumps to get through, but we have a quorum now. And uh, we'll get better at this as we go along, and hopefully we'll be able to stop it at some point. Um, agendas and staff reports are available on the city website at www.milwaukeeoregon.gov. The easiest way to locate them is to navigate to the community calendar where tonight's meeting page is posted. If you not review the agenda, please do so. It contains important information about the process we'll be using tonight. If you wish to be included in the mailing list for a decision, or if you wish to provide public comment, please log into the Zoom meeting using the link on the meeting page at the city website in order to be included in the meeting record. Public comments must be received during the applicable portion of the meeting. That is, general comments must be made during the open audience participation portion of the meeting and comments on specific agenda items, of which we have two tonight. Public hearings or work sessions must be made before the close of the public testimony portion of the agenda item. We will follow the basic format listed on the agenda, it includes all the hearing procedure steps, and we may uh, vary from this process based on the specific circumstances of the hearing. Uh, next on the agenda is the approval of the minutes for the April 14th, 2020 meeting. 
and I would ask the commissioners if they have any comments or corrections to make at this time. No. I hear no uh, comments or questions. I'll entertain a motion to approve the notes as presented. I'd like to make a uh, motion to accept the uh, uh, commission minutes from April 14th, 2020 as written. Do we have a second? I second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The notes are approved for the April 14th uh, planning commission meeting. Um, Next to the agenda, I would ask uh, the staff if there's any informational items that they wish to share during the meeting. Um, I have two items. On um, next Monday, which is um, um, a council meeting, during the work session, there's going to be a, um, a brief presentation regarding a, uh, um, a grant project that we've um, been awarded to, to look at a planned uh, bike way connection between the 29th, 29th Avenue uh, neighborhood Greenway and the Monroe Street neighborhood Greenway. So this would be how do we align, how do we connect those two uh, locations in a safe way? Our current um, uh, plans for that show a bike connection coming down through the Murphy property um, too close to the railroad tracks to really be feasible. So we applied for a grant to try to look at how that might work, try to get this sorted out before a application, development application comes in for the Murphy property. So um, this project's anticipated to go uh, maybe four months or so, um, but it's going to start this summer. So we're going to update the council about that on, uh, on the 5th. Um, and then the hearing for the comprehensive plan is still scheduled to open on June 2nd right now before the council. So uh, stay tuned on that. Uh, we're still hoping that that will be a time when we could actually have um, a, a, me a meeting at City Hall. Um, but I say stay tuned. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, there's an opportunity for the audience to comment on items that are not on tonight's agenda. There will be um, opportunity to discuss the agenda items at an appropriate time later in the meeting. But if you wish to comment on an item uh, that's on the agenda, we'll have time for that. Uh, does anyone in the audience wish to comment on an item that is not on tonight's agenda? If you do, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom so that we can recognize you uh, so that you can make your public comments. And once you're unmuted, please remember to state your name and address for the record. And can I add, the way you find that raise hand function is down in the, um, at the bottom of your screen, there's a participants button. Press the participants button and you will see a full list of um, uh, folks on the right side in that participants box. And in there, you ought, you ought to be able to click the raise hand function. So this is for, and that same process is gonna work during the hearings that are coming up. Okay, we'll give it a few moments, see if anyone's trying to find that feature. At this point, I don't think we have any uh, comments on uh, items not on the agenda, so we will move to the uh, public hearing. And uh, the next agenda item is a public hearing on Item CSU-2020-001. Uh, the purpose of this uh, hearing is uh, to consider this application, uh, which is a Ardenwall Elementary parking uh, change. Uh, the purpose of the application is a uh, community service use condition uh, for the uh, parking uh, uh, section of the Ardenwall School at 8950 Southeast 36, 36th Avenue. So the applicant has the burden of providing the, the application is consistent with the city of Milwaukee's um, 
uh, zoning subdivision ordinances, comprehensive plan, any applicable municipal code provisions, and that the proposal conform, conforms with all the city's applicable criteria. I would now ask the staff to cite the zoning ordinance section where the criteria can be found. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. You're good. Okay. Uh, Brett Kelver, associate planner with the city. I'll just run through the applicable criteria. They're from Milwaukee Municipal Code, Title 12, streets, sidewalks, and public places, section 19.301, low density residential zones, including R7, chapter 19.600, off street parking and loading, chapter 19.700, public facility improvements, section 19.904, community service uses, and section 19.1006, type three review. Thank you. So all testimony and evidence must be directed toward the applicable substantive, um, substantive criteria. Failure to address a criterion or raise an issue with sufficient detail to allow the planning commission an adequate opportunity to respond to each issue precludes appeal to the city council based on that issue. Failure to raise constitutional or other issues related to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient detail to allow response precludes an action for damage in circuit court. Any party withstanding may appeal the decision of the Planning Commission to the City Council. Persons withstanding are those who submit written comments or testify online by logging on to the Planning Commission's Zoom meeting through the City Calendar or the City website. Um, I will recognize those persons who have used the raise hand feature in Zoom to indicate that they wish to testify in the matter of the Ardenwall parking uh, uh, application. Once you're unmuted, please remember to state your name and address for the record so that may, they may be entered into the record. And if you testify, please remember to confine your remarks to the application and the relevant criteria to avoid repetition and irrelevant uh, uh, information. If additional comment documents or evidence are provided by any party, the commission may, if requested, allow a continuance or leave the record open to allow the parties a reasonable opportunity to res respond. Any such continuance or extension sh shall be subject to the limitations of the 120 day rule, unless the continuance or extension is requested or agreed by the applicant. Uh, I will now open this up to see if any of the uh, attendees uh, wish to uh, testify in this matter and I would allow three minutes for them to do so. So we'll give the attendees an opportunity to see if we have any raise hand comments coming in on this uh, particular you know, um, uh, pardon me, um, Chair Massey, I, th I think the the procedure here would be for Brett to give a staff report. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, then you're jumping ahead there, I think. I am. We also missed uh, the uh, commissioner's ex parte and whatever contact and visiting site. Did that... Do you have that on the script? Yeah, it's here, but it's... Um... It was at the... It's on page six, and I just read page five. Huh. Okay. Okay. So we'll go through all that. Uh, conflict of interest and site visits. Does any member of the Planning Commission wish to abstain from this hearing? No. 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 Does any member of the Planning Commission wish to declare an actual or potential conflict of interest? No. no. Yes. Would you state that conflict of interest? Yeah, so uh, Jen and Allie, and I don't know who's speaking tonight for the North Clackamas School District, but Jen and Allie is the uh, bus manager uh, for the district. She is my next door neighbor and a really good friend. Uh, and uh, we have not spoken uh, about this at all, but I just wanted to be out there in the open so that the public knew that, uh, just in case she was testifying. <laughs> Thank you. Does any of the planning commission, any member of the planning commission wish to report on any um, um, ex parte contacts? Please raise your hand in Zoom if you have any of those. I see none. Does anyone have any rebuttal to the ex parte contacts declared by the commissioners? I'll give the audience a little, a few moments to 
show of hand if they've got a rebuttal. I don't think we have any, so I'll ask uh, if any of the commissioners have visited the site prior to the hearing, uh, please raise their hand just uh, like I'm doing now. If you visited the site, thank you. Let the record show that uh, myself, Commissioner Hamer, and Commissioner Roosevelt have has visited the site. Uh, did any of those commissioners who visited the site speak to anyone at the site or note anything different from what is indicated in the staff report for this application? No. No. Does any member of the audience wish to challenge the participation of any member of the Planning Commission? And we'll give you a few moments to indicate your objections by raising your hand in Zoom. I don't see any objections. Uh, does any member of the audience wish to challenge the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission to hear this matter? And we'll give you a few moments to raise your hand in Zoom if you have any objections to that. I don't believe we have any. Now, let's proceed to the staff report presentation. All right, thank you. Good evening, uh, Chair Massey and Commissioners. Again, I'm Brett Kelver, Associate Planner with the City of Milwaukee. Um, I'm going to uh, share the screen. Oh, except I need to be enabled for screen sharing to present a PowerPoint presentation. Let me see what I can do. Okay. I'm, while Mary's doing that, one thing I might note that we discovered today is in the top of the, once Brett shares his screen, up in the top, you can um, view this as a split screen, which um, allows you to see the, see the PowerPoint and then have the, the panelists um, lined up on the right side, or actually you can move the panelists around, but um, either lined up on the right or in a cluster, so you can then see the whole, um, the whole screen. All right, so yes, if you want to take a moment to make your screen adjustment, if you want to, for example, I'm going to minimize the participant list on my screen so that it does not block my view of the slides if anyone wants to do that um, and on a note what we're uh, considering with this hearing this evening is um, with regards to Ardenwald Elementary School which is an existing approved community service use or CSU um, and what we're discussing tonight are some changes that have been made at the school that constitute a major modification to the school's CSU approval. So that's the context of our discussion this evening. And just for context, in terms of where we're talking about in the city, Ardenwald Elementary School is located in the heart of the northern residential area, the Ardenwald neighborhood. Um, it's on a border with the city of Portland city limits. You can see the dash line representing the, uh, the boundary between um, the city of Milwaukee and the city of Portland. Uh, it's also just across the street. The school is just to the south and across the street from Ardenwald Park, which is that small finger of the city boundary that extends northward there. For an aerial view, um, you can see the school property outlined in yellow here. Uh, uh, I think if you can hopefully see my mouse, um, I'm using it to indicate the location of 32nd Avenue to the west, 42nd Avenue here to the east, Johnson Creek Boulevard along kind of the northern part of the city, and then we have the school site here. Also, uh, the school is addressed off 36th Avenue, and here's 36th Avenue. So it's bounded by Roswell to the north, Wake Street to the south, 36th Avenue to the west. And just for some background, uh, the school, uh, Ardenwald Elementary School was in place for a 
long time. It was actually a historic building on the historic, uh, our list of historic properties. The image that you see here on the left is the view, an aerial view of the school property in 2007, shortly before the school was uh, removed from the historic resources list. Uh, the, it was demolished. And as you can see, looking at the image on the right, the, the site um, design was essentially flip-flop so that what had been open space on the eastern side of the school site was kind of shifted over to the western side. The new building uh, was constructed in what had been the open space on the east. Um, and the, the, the renovation and the redevelopment of the site enabled, as you can see, looking back from to the 2007 image to the present image, um, in the past there was a more limited amount of off-street parking. You can see here, here to the south. Um, on Roswell, there was some head-in parking here in what was actually a combination of the school property and the right-of-way. So we had a lot of vehicles backing into uh, Roswell Street, which is a neighborhood collector. So the redesign, as you can see, enabled um, the school and the school district to provide a lot more space for on-site bus loading for parent pickup and drop-off. So quite an improvement on the situation, in addition to getting a brand new, a brand new building and facilities. The, one of the key conditions of approval with the 2007 uh, community service use approval for this renovation of the school was um, that buses use the northern smaller loop off of Roswell Street, which seems a little counterintuitive. The original idea was to have buses use this longer loop uh, accessible off of Wake Street. However, uh, one of the parts of this project in 2007 involved a traffic uh, impact study and the, that TIS showed that with the, this design uh, as originally proposed, um, if parent pickup and drop off happened here in this northern smaller loop, what we would end up with would be occasional uh, vehicles queuing in the travel lane on Roswell Street waiting to get in uh, into this small loop. So uh, essentially the conclusion was that, you know, the loop was a little too small for parent pickup and drop off. Um, so uh, the school district had a couple options uh, about what they could do, maybe, you know, whether it was trying to provide additional uh, queuing space for the parent vehicles actually on the site or widening Roswell Street was another option. Um, at the end of the day, what the district decided to do was make some modifications to the driveways here at the smaller loop on Roswell Street so that they could accommodate bus uh, bus turning movements. And they accepted a condition of approval at the time that no more than six buses would be using the site at one time. That was the capacity of the smaller loop and parents would use the larger loop off of Wake Street um, for their pickup and drop up. You can see here that the, the driveways were designed a little more for just regular, um, regular vehicles. Over time, uh, so this was, you know, 2007 was that approval. I think the new school opened in 2008, 2009. And over time, I'm not entirely sure uh, the history of the any changes in the school administration, but uh, over time, uh, one way or the other, additional buses started needing to use the site. And just naturally, I think the administration at the time decided it seemed to make more sense just to allow buses to use the larger loop. It had a lot more space. Um, the pick up and drop off times for the school were essentially just uh, an hour in the morning and basically an hour in the afternoon. So I think the, the feeling or sense was that this wouldn't be that big a deal to make that kind of switch, that there'd be relatively uh, few periods of conflict there. However, and, uh, that was a condition of approval from the 2007 approval. Um, and um, although the, the school did make the change in actuality, they did start directing buses to use the, the Wake Street uh, larger loop and have uh, parents begin to use the, the loop off of Roswell. Um, once staff became aware of this change, we did get in touch with the school and let them know uh, that we would need to walk them through a major modification process to address this change as a condition of approval. And again, as the, a result of some of the traffic impact studies, um, uh, it was necessary to return to the planning commission to vi revisit the issue. So uh, we had a lot of productive conversations with the school district team about options. And essentially the, uh, the district came back with a proposal to, you know, to use the 
um, the two loops as originally envisioned. That is to have parents use the northern smaller loop off Roswell buses, officially use the southern loop. And um, to do that, they proposed a few physical changes uh, to, the, to the site. So one of those is on Roswell Street, one of the issues had been um, if you tried to have parent vehicles park on the street, um, the width of the asphalt on Roswell Street was not wide enough to accommodate parking on both sides of the street and to allow sufficient vehicle vehicles to kind of occupy a travel lane in each direction here. And that, again, kind of confirmed what um, what the traffic impact study had said in 2007. So the district has proposed to essentially widen uh, Roswell Street on the southern side here to create an, an area. They've marked it as kind of a right turn lane, but essentially it's um, new uh, on-street parking um, that will allow a space for parent vehicles to essentially park and kind of it'll function as a queuing lane during the those the one hour or so in the morning and one hour in the afternoon um, for parents to pick up and drop off kids at the school so that that's a pretty major um uh, adjustment to the site uh, by the school district is a considerable investment for them to make that adjustment and it does reflect again kind of what was determined with the traffic impact study in 2007 it's acknowledging that there needs to be a little bit more room um, on Roswell Street for traffic to, to pass um, in addition they have proposed uh, to temporarily restrict on-street parking in two locations near the exit driveway here to improve sight distance and prevent um, vehicle conflict so temp by temporary i mean for that period of time on each school day during the pickup and drop off uh, hours there would be no parking allowed on the street here to just provide better clearer vision and uh, better maneuvering room in addition, on Wake Street, uh, the district is proposing to make the necessary adjustments to the driveways to basically widen them as they were widened up the northern driveway of Roswell's to better accommodate bus movements in and out. The buses need a little bit more room, so they'll be widening the driveways. And then um, there is a, a demonstrated need to restrict parking during the time that buses are using the site. Parking on the north side of Wake Street, again, the buses need a little bit more room to get past any vehicles that might otherwise be parked here on the north side of the street and, and be able to get into the travel lane and not uh, block it for traffic coming the other direction. So that's another uh, part of the proposal uh, by the school district is to um, to temporarily during the pickup and drop off times to uh, restrict parking on the north side of Wake Street. The key issues that we addressed in the staff report uh, are essentially about two things. One was just making sure that um, these new adjustments would not uh, provide any detriment to public safety. That we, you know, we got uh, a proposal from the district to adequately widen uh, that space on Roswell Street to allow for on-street parking without more vehicle conflicts, um, and to widen the drive the driveways on the on the southern part at Wake Street to restrict parking on the street temporarily during the pickup and drop off times. And so our, our conclusion with looking at the proposal was that it did in fact, the, the district's proposal does in fact essentially improve safety while achieving the, the needs for uh, better pickup and drop off at the school. The second issue was um, kind of looking back at one of those early conditions of approval for uh, the 2007 approval, which was because buses were going to use the north, uh, that the decision limited and put a specific number limit on the buses that could access the site and so staff wanted to look at that question again and ask do we need to set a new limit on the number of buses um, and our conclusion was in part because there is some variety uh, to the types of buses and the lengths of buses that might use the site that rather than trying to identify a specific number of buses that should use the site that the um, the actual concern is about making sure that um, that we're not having traffic blocked on wake street by buses queuing up and waiting to get into the site so uh, our assessment of that was that really rather than a um, 
setting a new number of buses that can use the site. It's more important just to be very clear that um, the, the function of the school will not be allowed to have buses queuing on Wake Street itself. There should be adequate space now uh, in that southern loop for buses. So the uh, the criteria for approving a, a new con community service use or a major modification to one are these five things that are outlined here. Um, a couple of these are more relevant to this particular application. You know, for the most part, there are no changes being proposed to, um, you know, to the, certainly to the building itself, to the actual parking and loading areas on the site. More of what we're talking about are uh, things that relate to the public facilities, and in particular the driveway approaches, um, the street itself, on-street parking, um, and uh, the allowance of on-street parking. So um, our assessment is that we're really talking more about um, items B, and C, and D. Um, there are some specific standards for schools that relate to an assessment of public facilities and whether the proposal has adequate public facilities to perform. Um, there's, a, a, I guess, a point of clarification that uh, what's happening here with the district's proposal is not any uh, attempt to increase the capacity of the school. We're not talking about new classrooms or necessarily more buses coming because they're bringing more students. It's really about the, the function of the current school at its, at its existing capacity. Um, and then in terms of benefits, uh, I guess we're looking at it and thinking about uh, ensuring that there is safe, um, there's a safe facility for both vehicles, for pedestrians and bicycles with the changes that are proposed, as well as just making sure that it's safe for people to get on and off the site how, however they may they may do that so these are the criteria that you're looking at as commissioners for approval of this and that's what's been addressed in the findings that were prepared for you in short the the the, the couple of conditions of approval that staff is recommending um, relate to just being very clear that that the restrictions that the the district has proposed to on-street parking should be limited just to you know obviously those days when school's in session and during those hours when um, the the parent uh, pick up and bus pick up and drop off are happening rather than um, whether, rather than, for example, losing on street parking on the north side of Wake Street um, all year permanently. The idea is it's really a function of making sure there's space for the buses. So when school's in session or when those drop off and pick up times are happening, that's when the restrictions should be in place for on street parking. In addition, as you can see in the graphic here, the district's proposal was uh, based on the, the bus turning modeling that they had was that they needed about 150 feet of restricted parking on the north side of Wake Street in order to, to get, get buses safely back into the, the, the vehicle travel lane. That left uh, an area te that technically could have been parked at of, of about 18 or so feet between the end of their proposed no parking and the existing crosswalk here. That's not technically quite enough space to, um, to allow kind of, I guess, a, a standard vehicle as per our parking code to park. So the staff recommended recommendation there was just to realistically uh, extend that no parking restriction all the way to the crosswalk so we don't have people trying to park too close to the crosswalk at a time when the buses are going to be using the site it wouldn't be safe uh, for pedestrians trying to use that um, and then as I mentioned before the the other uh, proposed condition just to be very clear is that rather than setting a limit on the number of buses that would use the site that it would just be very clear that uh, we, we should not have any instances of buses queuing on Wake Street waiting to get in to use that southern loop. So with that, the options that we've presented to you uh, tonight for your decision are um, to work with the recommended findings and conditions that we prepared for you. If based on your discussions and any testimony that might come in, um, if you decide there are some changes that you need to make to either the conditions or the findings themselves, we could take those down and incorporate those into a decision. Um, the 120 day clock uh, for this application is takes us to early June. So there is technically time. If you think you need more time, we can continue this hearing uh, to gather more information or what, whatever you think might be needed. Um, or if, uh, if you decide that uh, you don't think the criteria are met, can't be met, um, then you have the option of denying the application. So with that, um, that's my presentation. I'll ask if you have any questions, and I'll just for now move this image back to an aerial of the site.
Are there any questions? Uh, I have a couple, if I may ask them. Sure. Um, first one, um, did they, uh, did the uh, NCSD, did they talk about uh, the crossing guard situation and what that might mean to the students that are using those crosswalk areas in that expanded area? Can you say a little bit more about that? Do you mean are they proposing changes to the to having crossing guards, or how will well, there are there are there current crossing guards? And for safety reasons, have they uh, understood um, that they're going to have a more of an impact at where that crossing is at Roswell? Yeah, that's a yeah, good question, and I think I may ask the applicant team to address that. They can probably speak to that with a little more detail. As I understand from the narrative that they presented, um, that they are still prepared to have um, monitors uh, on the site to help direct, um, especially the, the parent pick up and drop off traffic um, through that northern area. In terms of the folks who are doing the cross crossing guard work itself, I don't know exactly. I know that the because of the proposed widening of Roswell on, on this location here to just to the west of the entrance driveway that will extend the length of this crosswalk a little bit more so that obviously prevent, presents a little bit more space that needs to be protected when folks are trying to cross there. Um, I, I don't know myself uh, exactly the the nature of the function of the crossing guard there. So that's a good question. I think maybe we'll ask the applicant team to address that when they get a chance. Okay, and then could you flip to the picture where you showed the street view of Roswell? What happens to that telephone pole that is right there at the entrance? Does that end up getting moved into the center aisle or does that get moved into the side, the existing sidewalk? What happens to that telephone pole? Yeah, again, I'll ask the applicant team to confirm that. I, I know there was some discussion about actually relocating the, the pole and, um, and working with PGE to do that. Um, but it, yeah, I, I, I don't recall exactly what's what's going to happen to that pole. I, it's either moving or the design. Um, I think it's I think it has to move because of the way the that kind of on street parking lane, as it were, is going to flow right into the site. So I believe it's going to move. But I'll ask the applicant team to address that when they get a chance. All right. Thank you. Any other questions right now from the commissioners? So I'm happy to leave up um, an image if you'd like for now. Uh, when you invite the applicant team to uh, to present, just let me know what you'd like me to do with this. I prefer the aerial if it's possible. That one. You're uh, muted. Your microphone is muted. We haven't. We can't hear you. Thank you for that. So it appears that there's no uh, uh, no one in attendance for representing the school district. Is that what I'm understanding? I think there were. I think Andrew Tall and Rick Fuller were both uh, in the attendee list earlier. Yeah, I see both of those there, and I can make them present here. Yeah, why don't you pull okay. them into the? Yeah. Let's do that. Okay, we've got a we've got a hand raised from uh, Andrew to Andrew T. Yes, that's Andrew Tall. Okay. Okay, so both Andrew and Rick um, should be uh, allowed to uh, see them if they would like to be seen. Here we go. All right. Can everyone see and hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you so much for having us tonight. My name is Andrew Tall. 
here with 3J Consulting. I certainly appreciate all of the uh, time and effort that's gone into getting this meeting prepared. Uh, and as usual, I just need to thank Brett Calver for not only working with us for the past year and a half on this application, but putting together an excellent staff report and an excellent presentation. There's really, uh, whenever we come representing the district, Brett carries the majority of the load and does a great job sort of making the presentation. Um, so I will say on behalf of the district, we do not have any uh, quarrels with any of the conditions of approval that have been proposed by staff. Uh, and we would request approval of the application as uh, submitted with conditions by staff tonight. Um, to the two questions that were asked, um, so I don't know if you can see my cursor on the mouse or on the screen. No, if you'll tell me where you'd like me to. Well, so you're right in the, the right parking lot there, Brett. Um, so we've observed that parking lot functioning many times during pickup and drop off the northern one. Um, and there are not only crossing guards, but there are usually assistant principals sort of managing traffic flow throughout that parking lot to make sure that there's not backups that are happening onto Roswell. Um, it's a known issue to the school and to the district. Um, and that parking lot is very actively managed during drop off on, and pickup. And there's no plan to compromise safety or stop managing that, that pickup and drop off area. Um, obviously we're in a little bit different situation now, but um, parent pickup and drop off at elementary schools has dramatically increased over the past three or four years. The district is monitoring this as are all school districts across the country. And a lot of people are picking up and dropping off their kids as opposed to putting them on buses or letting them walk. And it's increased pressure on these pickup and drop off areas. And the school district has been very active in responding to that. And this is a managed pickup and drop off area and will continue to be so. Uh, with regard to the PGE pole that's in the right of way along Roswell, we are currently working with uh, PGE to relocate that pole. Um, this plan doesn't work unless we relocate it. So um, we believe we're gonna be successful in doing so and we're, we're actively involved in the process right now. I, am I in the right place? I think it's, I, I should have known from this, I could have gone to this image. I think this is the current location of the pole and it's obviously in the, in the middle of this, what will be kind of a, a maneuvering lane. Is that, that is that right? That's 100% correct, yeah. yeah. yeah so it, it and, has to move. And we've got plans submitted to PGE at this point and, and we have no reason to believe they're gonna uh, make us change the plan. I think it's moving 65 feet to the east, uh, to the center island, and the plans have been approved by a PGE. So, sorry, Andrew, you mean it probably like, uh, oh, to here, to we'll move to, yeah. okay. So with that, any, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take any, any further questions. Andrew, we may, the commissioners may get back to you. I want to give, I want to open this up to see if there's any additional public testimony before we do that. So hang with well, us for just a little while. Let me just close by saying how much I appreciate all your, your time tonight. I know this is difficult. I know this is unusual, but um, we're having lots of these kind of meetings at night these days, and uh, I appreciate you all showing up. It's just the way it is. So uh, let me ask if there's uh, anyone in the uh, audience um, who um, has um, testimony in support of the application. I don't see any hands going up, so I'll ask if there's any uh, uh, in the audience to wish to testify in opposition to the application. There's no hands coming up, and so I'll ask if there's any neutral testimony uh, for the applicant. And I see no hands coming up. Uh, at this point, uh, 
We may have some more questions coming to you, Andrew, because uh, I'm going to give the Planning Commission an opportunity to ask any questions or make any comments. Any of the Planning Commissioners wish to comment or ask Andrew any other questions? Okay, well, I've got uh, a couple. Is there is there anyone from the school district uh, on on the webinar? I think Rick Fuller, if he's if he's on and is not muted, he's he's representing yes, the school. Yes, district. Rick, Rick Fuller is uh, on. Thank you. Can we allow Mr. Fuller to speak? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Mr. Fuller, what, what is your uh, uh, role with the school district? Thank you. I work with uh, DCPM. I'm a project manager for the district, and I'll be managing the Ardenwald Elementary traffic and parking project. Okay. So are you a uh, consultant to the school district or an employee of the school district? Consultant to the school district with DCPM. What a, what a, okay. Okay. Thank you. So there is no... Um, um, uh, employee of the school district on the on the on the call. That's disappointing. Um, so, um, first of all, let me let me say to both Rick and to um, uh, Andrew that um, uh, I'm impressed with what uh, has been done. Um, I, I guess the only area I concern is kind of how we got here. Uh, and that uh, the original uh, conditions of use uh, were not in force and it was brought to the city's attention. And then some good things came out of it, but um, I, I guess I just wonder about, you know, you know how the, the, this is kind of coming after the fact. Um, uh, I, I guess I'm very attuned to, to uh, traffic safety, especially around an elementary school. And I mean, if we, if the, uh, if the district and its consultants feel like there's an issue that require all of these changes, I'm all for them. But I guess my question is, um, why didn't we anticipate these before the city came to the school district and say, you're not um, following the original conditions of use? And don't get me wrong, I like everything you've done. I'm just kind of trying to figure out the, you know, the, you know, the, the pre-process. Either of you have a comment there? I'll I'm happy to speak to that, if that's all right, Rick, unless you want to uh, chime in. No, absolutely, Andrew. All right. I, I, I do think that um, the primary reasons that we're having to come back and make these changes is that, well, there's two reasons, really. I think enrollment um, and bus loading have changed significantly since 2007 when the school was originally um, approved. And I think that... Uh, some years ago, during the initial opening days of school, there was a lot of congestion that was being felt by uh, the neighbors in the area, um, and it led to some complaints about traffic around the area. But uh, with a lot of schools, the first couple days, the first couple weeks can be bumpy, and then things seem to, to sort of smooth out. But, but either way, the complaint was made uh, it was noted that the school was not using the parking lots as originally approved that they had changed due to their enrollment and busing patterns. Um, and, and so ultimately, it, it required the district to focus on coming up with a, a comprehensive solution to this, which we believe we have come up with a, a really robust and comprehensive and safe solution to this. Um, this has also been taken to the neighborhood associations two times now. Um, and everyone seems to be in agreement that this this is going to allow the, the school to operate um, safely and efficiently and um, more effectively given the current busing and, and drop-off patterns that are happening. Uh, yeah, this I, is Rick. This yeah, is Rick. I don't have... I, I don't have anything to, uh, more to say on that. Um, I think, Andrew, you, uh, you explained it very well. Uh, uh, answering the question of how, how we got to this point, um, it was really, it was looked at by the principal who didn't have the history, ultimately, of, of the 2007 uh, requirements 
of the conditional use plan at that time. And so there was a decision made, I think, uh, to swap the parking it was a it was a general discussion. Well, that's a really good idea. Why didn't they do that uh, to begin with? And uh, you can obviously see that, uh, and everybody agrees it would be great to have had the school move to the south and the parking lots flipped over, um, but that's just not the case. So somebody in the history, and I don't really know, you know, all of it. But somebody in in the past, they made a decision and they flipped it. And it 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 looks like a good idea and actually there's less um there's less complaints since they flipped the um the parking lots um than there were before as admiral was saying so uh, yeah, I, don't, I don't want this to come sense. across as uh I, I i salute initiative uh and uh, and, and think all the right things were done and i like the the outcome here i just uh, i asked myself uh, you know why wasn't this done earlier um so that's my only point i don't think you you uh, it's probably unfair of me to ask you guys that question because that's uh, probably a question for the school district to answer but unfortunately they they uh, there's no one here that's, that's a great question chair massey and I, I believe me i've asked that question of myself here too okay Uh, any other commissioners have questions or comments? I, I do. Um, so my, my question is, is that if you're going to move the telephone pole uh, into the island and you have those mature trees there and you say that you're going to protect those existing trees, uh, I'm assuming those trees are tall enough that isn't that going to be a conflict? I'm going to move to the street view of that in oh, case yeah. it's a little bit helpful. I'm just I'm just unmuting myself here. Uh, we don't believe there's going to be any conflict whatsoever. Um, the the pole will, as you can see in its current location, it's it's not in the Planter Island in the parking lot. It's in the right of way. Um, and I guess secondly, PGE has has already approved the design and it's. Um, we're not anticipating any issues with the trees. Okay. Good question, though. Any other commissioners have questions or comments? I can add a little comment to that, PGE poll. Yes, go ahead, Mr. Adams. Okay, Steve Adams, city engineer. Uh, PGE, has, when they're moving poles like this, they have the ability to move the pole and not keep the same wiring configuration on top. I think the T and the cross, they can put a guy wire in the back of the pole and they can put all the wiring on one side of the pole. So they can extend arms towards the street to hold the wires to reduce the conflict with the tree. And I would recommend the design team and the school district work with PG and, and that kind of pole, that kind of pole design so the tree does not grow into a future conflict with overhead wires that now get moved several feet closer to it. Thank you for that clarification. So at this point, I'm going to ask uh, if the applicant has any rebuttal or any additional comments in response to the public testimony. Uh, the applicant has nothing further to add, except again, a note of thanks to all the questions, all the consideration, and especially for staff's time going through this process. Okay. So uh, since there are no other comments, I'm going to close the public testimony portion of this hearing. And uh, the public uh, testimony portion of this hearing on CSU 2020-001 uh, is now closed. Uh, no further testimony can be taken unless the public hearing is reopened. Uh, discussion by the commissioners. Is, is the commission uh, ready for discussion? Yes. yes. As am I. Uh, Commissioner Hamer, you got any comments for us? Yeah, um, I want to know if we can put in a condition of approval that uh, Mr. Adams' suggestion of uh, the one side telephone pole so it doesn't conflict with the trees can be added. I don't know if that's a, uh, a Justin question or if that's a Denny question or a Mary or a Brett or I don't know if we're allowed to uh, 
step on other people's toes with our decision. Uh, this is Justin uh, Garricky, city attorney speaking. Um, I would probably uh, be hesitant to put such a condition in, although uh, the city engineer has opined on that possibility and it very well could be true. A PGE might not want to do that for some reason that we don't know about. And so if you put it in as a condition of approval uh, and PGE says, no, we can't do it for whatever reason, then we're kind of stuck to fine. Can we put in a condition of uh, approval to make sure that those trees don't get removed because PGE considers them in the hazardous way? Well, can I, can I make a suggestion based on what I understand about the the parking, the off street parking code and the requirements for landscaping um, in parking areas? Um, I think if there were to be a conflict with the particular trees that are existing there right now um, and and they were to need to be removed there would still be a requirement that there be a replacement of trees there um, and and I not knowing exactly what species they are or kind of how they're uh, slated to grow you know how much taller because there obviously are trees that are better um, in certain locations where they're under power lines it, it may be that those trees might have to be removed but they would be required to be replaced and i think at that point we would um, encourage the, the school district to replace them with trees that wouldn't run into that issue again with ones that maybe have a lower canopy oh, so brad my question is, is do they have to re be replaced at the exact same spot on site or just somewhere on site well they would need to be replaced in that uh landscape plant and let me go again to the street view i think that the area where these trees are right now is is kind of like an end island of landscaping for the parking area and I, I believe the code does require that there you know there needs to be you know one tree kind of on each end of that island so we need to get some trees back in this location if these particular trees have to be removed uh, okay that's, that's my understanding okay can I ask a question uh, just to aid my understanding? It looks like where the current pole is located, there's the, the path of those wires already goes past the trees. Is that correct? It's kind of off the picture there. Uh, it looks like there's some kind of wiring. I think these are wires here. I'm sorry I don't have a, you know, I'm in this slide presentation, not an active like Google Street Viewer, we could kind of roam around a little bit more. It, there, it seems you may be right that there may be some low wires that are there already. Uh, I think that it, from my picture, the way I see it, it looks like there's low wires as well as high wires and that the, the requirement to move that pole so that they can construct the lane will just move the pole up further to the right of where that kind of red tree is in that picture. Is that correct? I think this is, it, I think this is where we're talking about the pole being relocated. Yeah. I, it seems like the wires are already passing the tree and that, that if they, they're not gonna change the path of the wire uh, much by moving the pole. I just wanna make sure, I mean, I don't know what regulations are to telephone poles and to trees, uh, but if there is, uh, PG has a rule that no tree over the girth of six inches is allowed to be within 10 feet of a telephone pole, then that tree needs to be removed. Or uh, during construction, they say, oh, look, this pole has a transformer on it, and uh, we don't allow trees within a certain distance uh, of a transformer. There's all sorts of rules that could be added in there. So. Could I pose a question then to the applicant? With PGE approving of the design, have they mentioned anything about impacts to trees at the site? I assume they conducted a site visit when they came to look at it. Uh, this is Andrew Tull, just responding on behalf of the applicant. We uh, understand that PGE has got no issues um, with the proposed design and there's no plans to remove the trees at this point. I will, I will just say um, the addition of a condition of approval, um, which could potentially impact PGE, um, 
would potentially cause a significant delay on our side. Um, and PGE, I mean, they ultimately controlled the design of poles within the right of way. Um, so they may, they may disregard the condition of approval um, and they're ready to start work in May. So um, again, we don't anticipate any issues retaining the trees that are there. PGE has approved the plans and um, again, they're 100% they're in control of their, their utilities. And if you'd like to pull up the aerial, you can see where that line sits in relation to the the trees it's it, 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 there's plenty of clearance on on our exhibit oh, sorry here yeah you can see the o, the ohp is called overhead power line on this drawing it's that dashed line mm -hmm. and after relocation i mean it's going to be well clear of the trees that are that are existing there I'm done with my questions. Okay, any other um, comments or questions from the commission? No. Okay. Uh, is the, um, I believe that we're um, ready for a motion and vote by the commissioner and I would be willing to entertain a motion uh, for this application. We have deliberations though. Uh, well, that's what I thought we were doing. I thought we were in the asking questions of staff or the applicant. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I was done with my deliberations. That's what I should have said. It, it turned into more of a question. Okay. okay. So is the commission oh, ready? Okay. So this is. Okay. So yeah. Yes. Okay. You have something for us, Commissioner Edge? Um, yeah, I said, I have, you know, we, everything looks, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the, the safety improvements are, um, you know, uh, undebatable. I think, um, I think this is, this is the right thing to do The uh, applicants, you know, satisfied with the conditions proposed by staff. Um, I'm satisfied with the conditions proposed by staff. I think it's appropriate not to put a number count, uh, limit on the buses, but to look at more of a performance standard, you know, and make sure that it's, it's functioning safely. So um, I think it's, you know, uh, I would be happy to vote uh, in favor of approving it with the conditions proposed by staff um, as put forward. Thank you. Any other uh, discussion <clears throat> by commissioners? So um, I will entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve application CSU 20. 20-001 and adopt the recommended findings and conditions of approval found in attachments one and two. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Loesveld, I didn't hear your uh, I raised my hand, sorry. Oh, okay. I... Yeah, I had to shift views there, okay. Uh, we have a unanimous uh, decision in favor of the motion. Thank you. Uh, if anyone wishes to appeal this decision to the city council, you must make uh, application stating the grounds for your appeal within 14 days of the mailing of the notice of decision. So please contact the planning staff for details uh, if that is of interest to you. Thank you, commissioners. Good night. Thanks, Brad. Thank you very much, commissioners. Have a good evening. So the uh, next item on the agenda is um, public hearing on item S-2018-001, Railroad Avenue Subdivision, uh, and that is called to order. The purpose of this hearing is to consider this application number um, and the uh, the purpose is that the application is request approval for a um, subdivision development, um, and it is located at tax lot 12E31DD0300, which is in the Linwood NDA, um, bound by Railroad Avenue and between Stanley and Beckham, Beckman. Uh, the 
applicant has the burden of pr uh, proving that the application is consistent with the city of Milwaukee zoning subdivision ordinance, comprehensive plan, any applicable uh, municipal code provisions, and that the pro proposal conforms with all the city's applicable criteria. Uh, I will now ask the staff to cite the zoning ordinance sections where the criteria can be found. All right. Um, okay, so um, zoning ordinance standards are chapter 12, street sidewalks and public spaces, section uh, 17.12, application procedure and approval criteria for land division, uh, section 17.20, preliminary plan. Section 17.28, design standards. Uh, section 17.32, public improvements. Uh, section 19.301, low density residential zones. Section 19.402, natural resources. Section 19.500, supplementary development regulations. Chapter 19.600, off street parking. 19 100 public facility improvements, 19.911 variances, 19.1200 solar access protection, and 19.1006 type 3 review. Thank you. Can I jump in for one sec? Um, Mary, can, um, excuse me, Mar Mary, do you have? Are there two potential mics there? There was a little bit of feedback happening while you were speaking, and maybe it's just being a matter of being closer to the to the microphone. Also the, the city computer that's picking up on it. Yeah, there's a little bit of feedback happening. Okay. If I mute the computer. We want to make sure there's still audio on the live feed, though. If so, it's the, is there less feedback now? Okay. And then I'll be notified if there isn't any audio on the um, live feed. So, okay, we'll see if that works. Okay. Um, before we proceed, let me ask for conflicts of interest. Does any member of the Planning Commission wish to abstain from this hearing? No. 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 Does any member of the Planning Commission wish to declare an actual or potential conflict of interest? No. 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 Does any member of the Planning Commission wish to report on any ex parte contacts? Please raise your hand. I see none. Does anyone have any rebuttal to the ex parte contacts declared by the commissioners so i'll give the audience a chance to raise their hand i see none will any commissioner who has visited the site prior to this hearing please raise their hand okay let the record show that chair massey commissioner hemer Roosevelt, and edge raise their hands Uh, did any of those commissioners who visited the site speak to anyone at the site or note anything different from what is indi indicated in the staff report for this application? No. 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 Okay. Does any member of the audience wish to challenge the participation of any member of the Planning Commission? I'll give the audience a, a moment to raise their hand. And I see none. So let's uh, proceed to the uh, staff report presentation. Okay. Let me share my screen. All right. Can everyone see my screen here? Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to move. So, um, my name is Mary Heberling. I'm an assistant planner with the city of Milwaukee, and um, I'm going to walk you through the staff report for file number S2018001. It's for a six lot subdivision off of um, Railroad Avenue. It's a vacant lot 
the tax law is 12E31DD03000. And let's see, here we go. Um, this is a picture of the property for you here. It's a vacant lot, as I said before, it's uh, 1.82 acres, so about 79,434 square feet to be exact. Um, you can see there on the northern boundary that there is a the stubbed street of 56th Avenue. And this is the zoning. Um, so it's zoned R5. It was actually rezoned um, last year before Planning Commission and City Council from R7 to R5. So its current zone is R5, as well as the um, property is directly to the west of it and the property to the east of it. Um, the north and west areas of the of um, of this property consists primarily of single family homes. Um, as you can see there, they're all um, zoned R7. And then to the northwest point of the site is a senior care facility who also owns the vacant property directly to the east of the subject property. And then um, directly south beyond Railroad Avenue are industrial uses. So this is a picture kind of a, of what the site looks like today. Um, it contains no structures. Um, it's mostly covered in non-native grasses, but you can see there there's clustering of vege vegetation. Um, and I'll kind of go into a little bit more of why that clustering happens there in that particular area of the site. Um, but this is a picture from closer to Railroad Avenue facing north. So. Um, that's what it looks like from Railroad Avenue area. And then you can barely see on the top left corner, kind of around here, that's where 56th Avenue is stubbed out. So um, talking about the um, existing vegetation on the site. So there are actually two wetlands on the northeastern corner of the site. Um, there's an intermittent stream that runs along the eastern boundary, literally right along that boundary line. And most of the bushy vegetation and trees exist in those areas, um, mostly because there is water that exists there, um, either um, mostly during part of the year. Um, and, then, uh, and then part of the year, there's not a stream hence the intermittent stream. But uh, it is pretty overrun by invasive species, in particular blackberry. Um, you can kind of see there right here, uh, and then some back there as well. But um, it is a, a wetland back in this area right here. And then this is a st the stream, the intermittent stream that runs through. You can sort of see a little bit of the um, gully there. So, um, as I said, there are wetlands, um, but we didn't actually have that listed in our natural resource overlay zone. So, there are overlay zones on this site. This is what is currently shown on our natural resource overlay zone maps. So, you can see here, the green is the water quality resource. That is a 100-foot buffer, you can see here. It sort of curves into that eastern vacant property. Um, most likely because when it was originally mapped, they may have thought that the stream here on this eastern boundary actually went into the other property. It doesn't. It just really runs along this eastern boundary line right here. And then uh, there is a 50-foot buffer on the edge of that um, water quality resource, that green line. That's the orange area, and that's our habitat conservation area. So those that's how it's currently um, zoned right now with our natural resource overlay zones. So the proposal for this property is for six lots of division. Um, we do our, we are required to do a natural resource review just because there are those existing natural resource overlays on the site. Um, for the pr preferred proposal that I'll go into a little bit further later on, there are some variances that are being uh, that are being requested. Um, reduction to minimum lot depths for all six of the lots. Reduction in the number of trees and shrubs for the mitigation plantings plan. And then for lots one, two, and three, which you'll see uh, right after this when I show the site plan, um, 
reduction if of lot sizes, reduction of the front and rear yard setbacks, and having buildable area in that habitat conservation area. So you can see here now an actual site plan of the proposal. You can see that there's uh, a continuation of 56 Avenue here that goes all the way to Railroad Avenue. It is a full 50-width um, street with sidewalks on both sides. There's also a multi-use path along Railroad Avenue here, as well as a street connection to the properties to the west. And it'll be stubbed out similar to how 56 Avenue looks right now, if approved. And then a pedestrian connection here towards the eastern property, the vacant eastern property. Um, and then you can see here, this is where the existing wetlands are, and this is where the intermittent stream runs. So like I said before, right along that eastern boundary. There is uh, about 24,600 square feet of open space. This is all gonna be its own separate tract, meaning that development cannot happen in this area, um, which includes obviously the wetland and the stream here. So there are a couple of requirements for this particular property that are why the proposal is what it is. So the, the stub street of 56th Avenue to the north, um, we have uh, actual code standards in our municipal code that if there's a stub street, it's meant to intend to continue as a through street once development happens of adjoining properties. Um, so with that requirement in the code, it's um, actually required that the applicants provide an extension of 56th Ave Avenue through the subject property to Railroad Avenue. There's also standards in our code that require um, connections to adjoining properties if redevelopment is a possibility. So you can see there on the eastern property, directly adjacent, it's uh, vacant. So redevelopment is a, a quite a big potential for that site. And so you can see that they had that pedestrian connection to the eastern lot to provide that sort of sense of connectivity to that lot. And then there was that street proposal to the western lot. So there's two quite large, you can go back a little bit. You can see these two lots here are fairly large. There's redevelopment potentials for those lots. And so according to our code, we need to be providing connectivity to um, not inhibit redevelopment of these sites. Go back. So um, that's some explanation for the street connect connectivity that's happening in the proposal. Um, a couple of other, other things. Minimum density for this site is five dwelling units and maximum is six dwelling units. So you, um, you can see that the proposal is six dwelling units with those six lots. Any new right of way, so that extension of 56th Avenue, as well as any open space, so, and also so that open space tract actually um, gets taken away from the gross area when you um, when you're doing your density calculations. So these density calculations account for those extra um, subtractions, essentially, from your calculation. So um, the site here is a little bit complicated in that uh, there are uh, natural resources, obviously. Um, and whenever you're doing a subdivision proposal on a natural resource zone, you're required to basically see if the existing mapped resources are mapped correctly. That's, that's a one way of describing it. So, um, so it's required of the applicant to do a wetland delineation report, which they did, and they found the wetlands that were on the site that were at, they were not actually mapped in our current uh, overlay zones, natural resource overlay zones. So what the report found was that the wetlands on the northeast portion are considered a primary protected water feature. And then the intermittent stream on that eastern boundary property line is considered a secondary protective water feature. So when we remap our uh, water quality resource areas, 
primary protected water feature is required to have a 50 foot buffer. And then a secondary protected water feature is required to have a 15 foot buffer. So what this means is that um, the applicant needed to readjust the overlay zones on the site to meet those re new requirements. Um, for that orange area, for that habitat conservation area boundary verification, it's um, it's a little less um, direct. And what it what it says is that any water feature, no matter if it's intermittent or if it's perennial, it needs to have a hundred foot buffer from that stream, um, even though a water quality resource may be, for example. Um, demoted essentially to a secondary water feature, which that intermittent stream was in, in the previous slide that I showed you. So um, what that did was significantly increase the habitat conservation area on this, on this zone. You can see here, this is where the water quality resource boundary line is. So this is 50 feet for that buffer of that um, wetland and then 15 feet here from that stream. And then the habitat conservation area is, is 100 feet from the existing water feature. So it's 100 feet from the wetland here and then 100 feet from that stream. So that's kind of how we get this new um, habitat conservation area and then this, this sort of decreased um, water quality resource area than what is currently mapped on the site. Um, and just for reference, the what's currently mapped there is the, it probably goes to about here and then drifts off into that eastern property. And that southern portion of the site does not is, does not currently have mapped a uh, any sort of natural resource overlay zone. So this this is an increase in the natural resource overlay zone with this remapping. So, um, Any time that you have uh, a, a subdivision proposal in the natural resource zone, there's a couple things that you have to consider. If, if you're allowed to keep at least 90% of the habitat conservation area and 100% of the water quality resource area in its own separate tract, um, then you, you have different standards that you need to meet. For this proposal, that's not what they're proposing. They're proposing to have um, obviously impacts within that habitat conservation area and then a little bit also in that water quality resource area. So since that, since they are gonna be proposing um, development within those areas, there are a couple things that they have to do. Um, one, it's an alternatives and impact analysis. Um, basically, they need to be stating, can they have adequate buildable area outside those natural resource areas? Um, are they able to mitigate potential future impacts to those areas if they are going to be in development in there? And then to the greatest practical degree, of, can they keep continuity in the HCA across all of the new lots? Um, and as you'll see, they are proposing to have buildable area within that uh, habitat conservation area. So I'll go into a little bit further there, but they are asking for a variance to that standard. So going into their alternatives analysis, they came up with uh, five alternatives. I'll go into each one. This is the first alternative. And as you can see here, it is different than um, what is what they ended up proposing. There is a actual full street connection to that eastern property line. And then there is that same street connection to the western property line here, you can see. And uh, they still have six lots. They all are um, over 5,000 square feet to meet the standards of the R5 zone. zone. But they are, all have um, lot depths do not meet the existing 80 foot standard for R5. Um, for a variety of reasons. And then um, you can see here the street 
is actually uh, goes into the existing water quality resource area and the HCA. If you can see the HCA goes like this. It's not on this on this site plan, but it is. Um, and so, with the street connection here, it uh, disturbs probably about 1,200 square feet of water quality resource down here, and then 3,200 square feet of habitat conservation area as well. Um, the our the city's natural resource consultant um, ESA did a review. Um, earlier on uh, this proposal and had concerns with this street connection stating that um, if there is a way to um, make it less um, so that you're you're disturbing less natural resource area that's that would be their preferred um, alternative and mostly for that the the applicant did decide not to move forward with this alternative because of those concerns for um, the natural resource areas with a full street connection here to the eastern property. So alternative two is um, a little bit different. You can see here it has a pedestrian connection to the eastern lot. So it got rid of the street and put in a 10-foot pedestrian connection. So significantly less disturbance to that, those natural resource areas over there. Lot one is moved farther away from the wetland, so less dis less close to disturbance to that wetland area. Um, and similar to that first alternative, um, all the lots are in size meet the requirements for R5, but uh, they are have um, their lot depths do not meet the 80 foot requirement. Um, and that is mostly because of keeping out of these natural resource areas that the stream here and with the street connection, the, the lot width for this site is just, um, it can't meet all of those objectives and still have 80 foot wide, 80 foot long uh, lots. So, um, and again, uh, yeah, it's, it is uh, lots one, two, and three also continue to be entirely in that habitat conservation area. That's the same, same as alternative one. And uh, buildings on all each lot, each lot, you can see that there's a, a building footprint here. It's showing that all lots, even though they may not meet those lot depth standards in the R5 zone, will still be able to meet all the setback requirements in the R5 zone. Um, so they can still build houses that will meet all of the setback requirements. And this is um, one of the applicant's preferred alternatives, mostly because it, it still provides those six slots that they need to meet to kind of justify the improvements that would be required for 56th Avenue connection here. And, uh, and it, it, it does avoid more of the natural resource area with that pedestrian connection to the eastern property. Um, they also prefer this alternative um, because it uh, has less encroachment on the natural resource area. You can see as this lot one was moved away from that wetland area to keep it um, free of development closer to it. And, um, and then the applicant also has, provered, uh, or has provided a mitigation plantings plan to show how they would be enhancing and mitigating disturbance in this natural resource area here, this open tract, which I'll get into a little bit later as well. Um, so we'll go into alternative three. Um, this is the preferred alternative. It's the one that I initially described in their proposal. And it's, it's quite similar to alternative two, except for a couple of different things. The actual buffer from this uh, stream area here is larger. So it's about a 25 foot buffer versus a 15 foot buffer from alternative two. Um, because that is the case, lots one, two, and three are undersized for the R5 zone. So they are um, 
uh, in around 4,000 square feet, in between 4,000 and 5,000 square feet, but um, they are, do not meet the standards of a 5,000 square foot lot. And again, similar to all the other previous alternatives, the lots do not meet the lot depth standards as before. Again, it's for the same reasons to preserve the natural resource areas and also have that street connection, 56 Avenue street connection. Um, so the uh, staff, um, we had inis initially suggested this preferred alternative. Um, one, because we understand that the economic reasons of the applicant for wanting to have six lots. Um, uh, with the 56 Avenue improvements, full street improvements, um, that's a lot of public improvement on that on the developer. And so we understood the, the need that they wanted to have six lots for this proposal. Um, we also, but we also wanted to see more buffer for that natural resource area, which is why we increased that buffer area from 15 to 25 feet. Um, so that there would be a more chance to provide more mitigation to the natural resource area, especially in, in the areas that seem to be the most um, significant vegetated areas. So anything that's close to the water, there's a lot more of that bushy and tree vegetation that um, that, that definitely could be uh, improved upon, especially getting rid of those invasive species and, and actually adding to what's already there. Um, I forgot to mention before, but the applicant also prefers um, this alternative and alternative two. And in keeping the, the six lots, um, they felt that the quality of the habitat conservation, the newly mapped habitat, habitat conservation area, I'll get it, um, doesn't doesn't. Um, doesn't meet the, it's not as well good of a area because it is just main, mainly non-native grasses versus closer you get to the water resources, you're getting that denser vegetation, which is what they want to avoid. Um, and so they feel that the areas of HCA that are grass tend to not have the same level of need for um, mitigation and preserving as as those other areas. So that's why they, they prefer to still keep the six slots there. So I'll go into alternative four. I don't have site plans for the rest of these other alternatives, but this is to show um, avoidance, total avoidance of those newly mapped natural resource areas. So alternative four is to avoid uh, the habitat conservation area totally by eliminating those lots one, two, and three and keeping just three lots, those four, five, and six on those western side of that 56th Avenue. Um, this would still continue to uh, have that 56th Avenue extension and a street connection to that western lot, but also there would be kept that pedestrian connection to the eastern lot. The main difference is that it eliminates lots one, two, and three. Those are the biggest disturbances into the natural beast for stones. Um, so that would be a total avoidance of that. Um, there are a couple of reasons why the applicant had concern for this alternative. Um, one being those lots, those loss of three lots. Um, economically, they don't believe that it would um, be proportional to the amount of uh, public development, public street improvement that would be required for them to, to build. Um, they also acknowledge that the site was rezoned from R7 to R5 by the Planning Commission and City Council to essentially allow the option to do more, more lots. Um, so it kind of the elimination of three lots down to just three lots kind of defeats the, the purpose behind the um, zone change. And then they also believe, again, as I mentioned before, that the quality of that habitat conservation area doesn't really uh, uh, warrant total avoidance. Um, 
their preferred alternative avoids those areas of the natural resources that are more sensitive, that have more vegetation, but um, they don't believe that those gr non-native grass areas are as significant as those other areas that they are avoiding. So they don't quite agree that, th that it needs to be fully avoided. Um, yeah. So I'll go into alternative five. And alternative five is also total avoidance of the natural resource areas. It's again, similar to alternative four where those lots one, two, and three would be eliminated, but to still meet the density allowance for that site, those five dwelling units and six dwelling units, um, they could cluster development on that western portion of the property, um, such as duplexes, triplexes, or townhomes, different types of attached housing that could maybe fit a little bit better into that smaller area of the site. Um, and this, this is allowed through our natural resource cluster development standards. So it basically allows flexible site design for types of housing that's not allowed traditionally in the R5 zone to basically transfer the density from those three lots close to the net in the natural resource area elsewhere on the site. So um, a couple reasons why the uh, applicant did not prefer this alternative. Um, one, the, the property owner slash developer um, isn't as well versed in attached housing and multifamily housing. Um, and so they're not quite familiar with that type of housing. That was not their main intention for this, this site. Um, and that's not the reason why they wanted to develop on there. Two, um, the applicant states that attached housing wouldn't justify the same frontage improvements as single family development. Um, so they don't believe that the 56th Avenue extension um, is as justified with attached housing as it, as it is with single family houses. Um, and then similar as, like I've said before, Again, they just don't feel that the quality of that habitat conservation, the grass area, is uh, warrants total avoidance. Um, and so, uh, again, this was not one of their preferred alternatives. So I mentioned a little bit ago that the applicant had come up with a mitigation plan, planting plan for um, their proposal, that uh, proposal two and three, very similar. Um, they had a mitigation plan. Um, the language in our natural resource code does go into some specifics on how you should be mitigating if you're gonna be having development in natural resource areas. The main goal of the code is basically they want dense riparian area. They want to be able to keep um, and better the areas so that they, you know, they are uh, protecting existing wildlife, um, uh, water features, and all of those sorts of things. So um, the code basically states that five native trees per 500 square feet of disturbance are required for mitigation plantings, and then 25 native shrubs per 500 square feet of disturbance are required for um, mitigation plantings. For this particular proposal, for proposal number two, which again, there was three lots in those habitat conservation areas. So it, it came to be about 18,500 square feet of disturbance in those natural resource areas. Um, our code would say, okay, you're gonna be doing that amount of disturbance. We require 185 native trees and 927 native shrubs. That, that's with that really specific um, standard that they had. The applicant's current proposal, mitigation planting proposal, has 15 native trees and 117 native shrubs, and I'll show that proposal here. So this is what it would look like with that alternative to, you can see here, the, the trees and then the shrubs as well, right here in all of that open natural resource tract area. And then, of course, there, there are some existing trees on the site that um, none of the proposals are proposing to eliminate any trees that already exist on the site. Um, they would just, they would be a part of the additional plantings. 
so with all this information, <laughs> there's a, a couple things, a couple of key issues that we want to bring up with you. One being, is that habitat conservation alternatives analysis adequate? Um, two, is the variance to the amount of mitigation plantings justified? Um, is the 25 foot buffer from um, for alternative three, the additional um, buffer, is it reasonable level production for that stream area? Um, are the variances to lot size and front and rear yard setbacks appropriate for lots one, two, and three? And is the variance to the buildable area outside of the habitat conservation area um, justified? And then finally, are the lot depth variances for all lots appropriate? So I'll go into these key issues here. Um, and the first key issue being is, is was there an adequate alternatives analysis? Um, when you look at an alternatives analysis, it needs to provide a couple of things. It needs to show that no practicable alternatives exist that will not disturb the water quality resource or the habitat conservation area. Um, the extension of 56th Avenue, whether that ex the extension was always going to be in a little bit of that habitat conservation area. Um, there's no way around that, that being able to do, uh, have the extension and not kind of meet that. So, so in that respect, um, there wasn't really an alternative to kind of uh, have that extension and not have a little bit in the habitat conservation area. Um, and then the applicant again stated that the nature of that, the grassy area of the habitat conservation area, the open grass field doesn't really uh, warrant um, the alternatives to actually have full, um, to not be in any of the natural resource areas. Um, so that was their justification for um, the, essentially the alternative three proposal. Um, and then you also need to consider development in the water quality resource or habitat conservation has been limited to the area necessary to all of the proposed use. So in that alternative three, there were, again was that 25 foot buffer along the stream there. Um, and then that limited site impact to what the applicant believes is the necessary habitat and water quality resource areas that are um, that should be protected. So um, the, the applicant believes that they are limiting development um, to those that are necessary to have limitations. Um, also part of the alternative analysis you need, you need to show is disturbed. The water quality resource and habitat conservation area can be restored to an equal or better condition. Um, the water quality resource on the site actually already is considered quite good, um, but there are obviously uh, invasive species on the site. So being able to mitigate those areas would actually be able to eliminate some of those invasive species and bring it into better condition because you'd be allowing more vegetation in that area as well as getting rid of those really um, harmful invasive species. Um, but again, the uh, applicant is still requesting a variance for those mitigation standards to have some, not as many plantings as is per required from the code. And then uh, finally, if you have an alternatives analysis, you need to show that road crossings will be minimized. Um, in the preferred alternative and alternative three, the moved a street connection to pedestrian pathway, basically um, moving quite a bit of disturbance in the natural resource area from a street to a pedestrian connection, still meeting that connect, uh, connection requirement by the code, but um, making it so that there's much less disturbance to, to the site. So, um, I'll go into the other key issue, which is the variance to that habitat conservation mitigation planting requirement. Um, basically, is it justified? Is the 25 foot buffer a reasonable level, level of protection? Um, 
So the code does state that proposed plantings will achieve comparable or better mitigation than if the applicant complied with the mitigation requirements. Um, the applicant uh, is a little bit concerned about the amount of plantings that would be that are required for our code. Like I said, it was 900 something shrubs and um, 100 something trees. Um, and they were concerned about if, if it was too dense. Um, and we're wondering if mitigation could be better achieved with planting them a little bit more spaciously like they are proposing. Um, as staff, we, we think that a, a good condition for them would be to have a mitigation plan that ensures that there are an appropriate amount of trees being planted that will be achieving the, the ultimate goal of the code section of riparian areas. Um, whether that means the uh, current amount that the applicant is proposing or or maybe a little bit more. Um, I think staff would also prefer um, the 25 foot buffer propose an alternative three so that there's more protection of that natural resource area close to the stream. And then um, staff would also recommend a condition to have see-through fencing on those back lots of lots one, two, and three that are facing the stream so that there aren't, they aren't, it isn't site obscuring and that uh, mitigation, that mitigation area would be well maintained and not treated as some sort of like random natural area where people can dump um, debris or yard debris or stuff like that. We will want it to kind of feel as uh, an area that needs to be maintained. So I'm, I'm going to go into, um, I mentioned previously that the city's consultant ESA did an initial um, review of that first alternative, alternative one, and they suggested the, um, the removal of the street to the eastern property into maybe full removal or something that's less disturbance. We also had them review um, the applicant's alternatives analysis and their mitigation plan. So I'm, I'm gonna uh, talk about some of their um, findings in the report on that. Um, they, in their report, they did recommend a six alternative, which was basically, instead of six single family lots, they would suggest five family, single family lots. Um, and that would be a six alternative. Um, they also uh, had, recommendations on that mitigation plantings plan that the applicants provided um, saying that the amount of mitigation plantings required per code could be met with tree spacing of 10 feet off center and shrub spacing of five feet, feet off center. center. Um, as staff, we had questions on if that was appropriate for the site and um, would that be able to meet our tree canopy goals if, if trees are more densely packed and shrubs are more densely packed, yet we may be meeting dense riparian area standards, but uh, the city does have a tree canopy goal, a 40% tree canopy goal, and would we would we be able to kind of mitigate the, or have a trade-off of meeting tree canopy goals and having less dense, um, vegetation on the site. So we had our um, urban forester, Julian Lawrence, with the city kind of review that um, those recommendations by ESA and um, and a couple of things that I wanted to note. And I just received them today, so um, that's why you may not have um, gotten any notice about it. So um, uh, he had no major issues with the shrubs minus some different planting choices that the ESA report had recommended, um, but wasn't particularly a fan of the 10 foot spacing of trees, un but understands the reasoning behind it, meaning that uh, 10, foot 10 foot off center spacing, you could do it in clusters maybe and be able to do that. Um, his preference would be to open up the spacing between trees to reduce light and resource competition in an area that's already kind of challenging and uh, prefers 20 foot minimum spacing for trees, um, but is obviously willing to um, 
see if the clustering idea from ESA works, if that's the path that the Planning Commission wants to move forward with. But those were um, his kind of insights on that. And as Denny and I are not natural resource experts, it was, it was nice to get um, input from ESA and Julian as well. So finally, uh, we're on to the last two key issues that we wanted to bring up with uh, Planning Commission, and this one is on lot, lot depth variance. So as I mentioned, um, it's needed for all lots, uh, mostly because of the 56th Avenue extension and making sure that the natural resource area is protected to a certain extent. Um, it, the site is just not really wide enough to be able to allow all of those things to be met. Um, so there has to be some trade-offs, and the trade-off was um, those lot depth standards. For lots four, five, and six on the western side of the property, um, they can still meet all setback standards. Um, and so uh, staff didn't really have any sort of issues with that. And then on lots one, two, and three, like like we said, for that alternative three, the um, setbacks would have to be reduced so that uh, the development, there would be more flexibility for development on the site, but they would be reduced from 20 feet front yard setback to front and rear yard setback to 10 front and rear yard setback. And city staff is um, supportive of that, of that request because of the um, the goal is to basically provide more of a buffer to that natural resource area. And then finally, the last key issue is, as I just mentioned, those variances on lots one, two, and three. There's there's a couple of different ones on there. Um, those front and rear yard setbacks as well as lot size. So they are undersized for the R5 zone, though they are below 5,000 square feet. Um, and their front and rear yard setbacks would be reduced from 20 to 10 feet. Um, basically, this is to allow an extra buffer, extra wide buffer, um, a 25 foot versus 15, um, and then allow flexibility for development on those sites um, so that the, the uh, applicant isn't struggling to fit um, new to fit buildings on the property um, with the increased protection of the natural resource area. Um, and then, as we've mentioned throughout this whole presentation, the, the variance to the buildable area outside of the, the habitat conservation area. So those lots one, two, and three are solely covered in that habitat conservation area. There's, there's no way around it. Um, and uh, basically, the, the main discussion around this is really about that quality of the resource. Um, the grass area is the quality. Um, does it permit needing to have actual uh, full avoidance? Or is the 25-foot buffer to that inter intermittent stream, that, that wider buffer, um, is that going to meet the needs for the habitat conservation area on that site? Um, as staff, we we think that there is possibility to meet to meet that, and that the twenty five foot buffer is is justified. Um, but obviously, uh, it's up to you all to make decisions. So, in conclusion. Um, as, as you know, as you may have noted, there isn't, there aren't findings. Um, there are some conditions already for, um, for the applicant, but there aren't findings in that we kind of wanted to get a feel of how uh, planning commission felt on the alternatives and kind of the final conclusion um, and get their insights before we did any sort of um, official findings for this proposal. So, um, but as staff, we believe that the findings can be developed from, um, and that uh, and that will adequately, adequately address the approval criteria, um, which would be for at the next, whatever the next planning commission would be with city staff would provide the findings for whatever the conclusion is here. And so as planning commission, you have, um, staff does have some recommendations for you. Um, one, you can tentatively, tentatively approve the request subject to an updated mitigation plan. Uh, 
few direct staff to return to the commission with findings for approval and final conditions of approval and three continue that public hearing for final action and adoption of findings on may 12th it could also be the second public hearing in may if there may not be enough time to kind of uh, meet planning commission's um, questions or standards that they want addressed at the next planning commission hearing so may 12th is not it could be adjusted to the next may meeting as well so i i know that that was a lot of information i'm sure there's some questions out there um, and i'm happy to address any as well as the the applicants are also on this um, call as well so they are able to answer questions as well after i am Okay, for the commissioners, do you have any uh, clarifying questions for Ms. Everly? I do. Go ahead. So um, on, um, on page seven, uh, figure five, um, this is showing the 100 foot buffer mm -hmm. um, that extends into, um, and in some cases, uh, across the center line of the post uh, street connection. Mm -hmm. um, th this is what the HCA boundary should be um, pursuant to um, face value of the code. Is that correct? Correct, yes. And um, again, we did not get a site plan showing um, alternative uh, four or five. Correct. Um, and then uh, last question relating to, I, was, I guess I was a little uh, confused by the city foresters um, recommendation. Um, would that be effectively cutting the mitigation requirements for trees in half over the, um, the code, you know, 900 some, or um, did, I, did I misinterpret that? Um, I think Denny might have done a little bit of calculations on that. He may be able to better relay that. Again, it's a little more than half. If you um, if you were to set out a grid and space plants at um, ten feet um, or yeah, ten feet, um, and then switch that to a um, a twenty foot spacing, I think it goes from nine to four if you were just looking at one set um it may be a little bit different i, I didn't look at trying to trying to do multiple sets it, where they start to overlap so i can't tell you exactly how that would work but the the difference being um that a uh, uh for most tree canopies most types of trees that have a larger canopy if you're planting them at a 10 foot spacing you end up with um you know hedges in some cases and some of those types of plants some of the plants that were recommended actually create a, a, a hedge rather than um a, a tree you know a, a larger canopy with a um uh some plants down below some some shrubbery down below um the the key difference here is, is the standards weren't written for a situation like this where um, you're taking uh, sort of a larger portion of the HCA and then um, generating the number of plants that need to be replanted. There's um, that 18,000 square feet of HCA that's going to be disturbed that it, and it currently exists as an open field. You've got sort of wetland type plantings that are supposed to go in um, in, an, in replacing an HCA that is not um, of the same character. So you're so with the area that's left, the, the plantings end up being really too dense was our, our conclusion. And that was the, also the conclusion of, of um, the uh, uh, forester. Um, so I think it's a, I think it's kind of what, what are we, tr what are we trying to achieve um, with our plantings and um, what seems appropriate for this particular site where the quality of the, the HCA that is being, um, that would be impacted is 
so much different. It's just a you know than a than a, a riparian zone. So anyway, that was a, that was our conclusion in looking at this. Do we have any guidance about how we might craft the condition to accommodate the um, the arborist um, recommendations? Yeah, I think we could come back with a. Um, um, a couple different ways, I think. Um, one is come back with a plan that gets us 40% tree canopy overall on the site, um, not just the HCA, not just the mitigation area. Mitigation area, um, uh, Julian suggested a, a 20 foot on center spacing would probably get there. That's still a heck of a lot of trees. And a, and a variety of trees as well. Um, Julian had had proposed some larger um, type of trees that would would grow to be a um, larger size than the ones that um, ESA had proposed. So ESAs were more shrub-like trees. Um, so I think there was. You know, just I think what I would almost suggest, and this comes uh, comes back from a discussion that I uh, that we had with uh, Chair Massey, is rather than if if the commission's so inclined later, rather than propose conditions on the mitigation plan at this point have the applicant come back with a mitigation plan don't don't close the hearing but continue the hearing so that the applicant comes comes back with a mitigation plan that you can then review okay great thanks jenny i have no more questions for staff thank you any other um clarifying questions for the staff i have a question for staff so uh, uh I guess what I'm wondering is about land ownership. Uh, you are asking uh, the applicant to put a wire fence up um, 30 feet or uh, distance from the stream. Who owns that land between that and the stream and who is there uh, to protect it and take care of it? Um, I'm assuming you want a wire screen so that people can't hide back there uh, or so things can't hide back there, people and uh, objects. Um, and so who owns that and who's responsible for maintaining it and cleaning it and that kind of stuff? Well, I think I'll, I'll jump in, Mary, since I had, I had suggested that, that, um, the, the idea that the, the, the strip along the stream will be in a homeowners association and maintained by the homeowners association. That's what the, our proposed conditions um, state. The idea was it's likely that people will want to put fences up. So if they do put a fence, if they do put fences up, that back fence towards the open space ought to have some component of, of, of transparency or be see-through rather than a solid wooden fence. Primarily to you know make that amenity part of that lot because those lots are going to be shallow um and um they be very they're going to be very shallow you know they're, they're this would then give them some more visual space in the backyard but also because if you do put a fence up often in those types of situations where you're backing up on some um heavily wooded area I mean, I've seen people take their grass clippings and just dump them over the fence. Yeah. You know, so you want to make it, you, you want to give people that visual connection to that area rather than having it blocked off. Um, so that was the, that was the so, idea there. So could a four foot high solid wood fence or a three foot high solid wood fence or a split rail fence or something like that or? That might, well, that might work, but um, what people like to do, what people generally want, what we see are people want to have a dog and they want to fence it so the dog's not going to jump over. So, you, so those lower fences, um, we get, we constantly are dealing with fence height questions um, because people want taller fences in their front yard or their backyard because of the 
because of their dogs. Okay. So my this next question. Come up with a, this was trying to come up with a way to um, anticipate those types of issues. Okay. And so I, I, I want to know a little bit more about the stream. Actually, I think I know maybe enough to answer the first question is uh, that stream ends on Railroad Avenue, right? It's not piped down into the Minthorn area, is it? I think it dumps into the ditch, but there may be a culvert somewhere along that ditch, the, the ditch along Railroad. It just ends there. And where, and where does the stream begin? Um, but, uh, up. Mary, do you have, can you get a map? Do you have a vicinity map? Um, it, it's, it, it actually um, extends up and then crosses um, uh, what's the name of what street am I thinking of? Um, yeah, well that one that that sort of works. Yeah, it's like it's up here. And then it goes and then it goes off to the east. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, point I'm sorry, point to it again. I was in the wrong screen. It's kind of like up around here. And then it, it so goes it, in the, the, it's, it starts in the big vacant lot, the sister's vacant lot. I'm not sure, but it cro I think it crosses over towards um, Stanley Avenue and is culverted under Stanley Avenue. Oh, all the way up there. Yeah, but it but it it's mostly storm drainage that's right. picked up. I mean, it, it looks like it was dug for cows for cows to be able to drink out of at one point in time. It it um, is. A it's not natural by, by any means. It, it was intentionally uh, made. Right, right, intentionally made? Okay. Yeah. So uh, intentionally made streams requires habitat uh, conservation uh, area? Well, they I mean, the, the argument is that the vegetation already exists there now. I mean, the, the stream's there, and so, so are the species and the habitat now. Okay, and, and they're not proposing to remove any of those trees that are currently standing, correct? Well, except for maybe the one down in the bottom corner. Um, no, I don't think they're proposing any, but um, the applicants can, can clarify that. But my understanding is none are being proposed to be taken down. Okay, thank you. The mitigation, when they, if they do a mitigation plan, they, they might do a closer look at what, what's there and if there's some of that stuff is invasive and should be removed. Is that is the pump uh, that's down there? Is that on the? Uh, I'll call it the convalescent. It's not convalescent. It's the nursing home side, or is it on their property? Do you know? Did you even know that there's a big pump there? No. No. Okay. I don't think it's on this property. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Somewhere down there by the bottom. I can't remember which side it's on. All right. I'm done. Okay. Any other clarifying questions for the staff? Uh, we'll move on to the applicant testimony. Okay. Let me move them over to panelists here. Okay, so uh, Jeff Bolton and Mark are uh, the consultants for the applicant, and so I've put them as participants, so they're allowed to um, speak if they choose to. Um, if you have any questions for them, they're available as well. Yeah, I'll give them the opportunity to, to make any comments they want at this point. This is Mark with Multitech Engineering. Good evening, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the commission. This, uh, we certainly appreciate all the efforts that staff and you are going through in order to conduct the meeting this way. We, this is certainly a different environment than most of us have, have ever had to work in. I've been doing land development for 40, engineering work for 46 years, and I, this is the first time I've ever had to deal in this type of a 
this type of an environment. So we appreciate all of the all of the extra effort that everybody's having to go to in order to be able to participate in this manner. We we have had a a, a great working relationship with your staff on this project since we became involved in it. Our client had to start getting involved in this project about three years ago. And uh, we have worked with your staff on various alternatives of how to try to develop this piece of property and, and have had to, uh, as they have had to uh, grow, as we've learned more and more things about this site from whence we started. So we've, we've worked hard to come up with a way to, f to find an economical development plan for this site in, in with the, some of the goals that we're trying to achieve there are to maintain the same character as the, as the existing single family areas to the, to the north uh, and east and west of us. So that's one of the reasons why why our client picked this site was because he's he has um, part of his group is a is the single family building part of his group organization, and so they would be the ones that would come in and and build the homes in here. So that particular group is not suited for building um, higher density multifamily type. They're they're more more in tune with, build, with building the single family style homes that, that are more consistent with what's going on in the area there. So in, in this development process from our side, we work with staff and have moved through various different approaches, some of which you saw in, in the alternatives, one that didn't show up, which was very early on, which was to extend 56 into the property, but not to go through to, to railroad, which was one of the things that was being talked about. But staff uh, clearly noted that the, your code um, makes, makes it clear that streets that stub into property are supposed to continue through the property. So that extension of 56 out to, to railroad created a, a different, a little bit different types of challenges for us in order to be able to figure out a way to come up with an economical development. I'm sure that most of you are um, are familiar with, with land development and in, in the sense that you've probably heard a lot of it. The, the, the costs associated with the development of a piece of property are, are for the most part related to the, the, ex, the amount of street frontage improvements that have to be built. So in a, in a typical and lot that would be developed in, in, in this type of a zone, if we didn't have the, the narrow constraints of the site, you would be developing lots that are, that are probably 50 feet in width that are, that are more conventional, that are gonna be 80 to 100 feet in depth. And, and with that type of pattern, given the consideration for extension of, of Beta Street to the west, you would probably create somewhere between 12 and 13 lots on, on a street frontage like this. So here we're, we're sitting there looking at creating only six lots in here for the same amount of free street frontage. So we've more than doubled the actual improvement costs that this property's and this project's gonna have to endure in order to be able to, to create this project. So that's that was one of the things that keep driving us back to trying to figure out how to how to get stay with this as close as we can to the six lots in order to make this work. We've we've patterned this with making shallower homes but wider homes in order to fit with their in keeping with this with what our site plan shows, and and we think we can can create our client can create some attractive homes with that. The, of course, the biggest challenge that we faced in here is, of course, the, the HCA limits and the natural resources overlay that you have in here. And we've we worked with staff in order to come up with some different alternatives. Now, we we didn't prepare an actual site plan for for alternative four. Um, we didn't do that because that would have eliminated three lots, which in our world, just it's just not economically feasible to even consider that alternative, it doesn't work. 
And then the alternative five, which was the cluster homes, we looked at that what cluster homes might, the cluster type of development might be, but the, the dilemma that you get into when you try to cluster homes together in an attached format and townhouse style format is that they are narrower in order to make that happen. So they have to be deeper in order to be able to achieve the same things that you're trying to, to get into a, into a home. So by the time you figure the setback from the street to the garage, put a garage and then put a living unit, even if it's two story in there in order to achieve uh, you know, somewhere between 12 and 1600 square foot of living world, living environment in there, then those lots, instead of those lots, four or five and four and five over there that are in the 69 or 70 foot deeps, they would have to start to push out to be closer to 100 foot in depth in order to be able to make that work. And as you can see by that site plan, what that would do then is it would shove the 56 extension east and push it further into the into the HCA area. Um, so we we didn't consider that to be a very good alternative in that we would be creating a housing type that's different than what the neighborhood has today. It's not consistent with what our client was hoping to be able to create. And we don't believe that it that it reduces the impact to the HCA very much by that approach. And um, it, particularly when we when you look at staffs that preferred alternative three, the staff has has focused on where we can create that that nice 25 foot buffer along the back of those three lots and can maintain a fairly good size area over there around the wetlands. We we think we can create a fairly uh, nice uh, amenity to add to the to your natural resource area as opposed to the other alternatives that are available. We, um, in discussing yesterday with staff and reviewing the, the report from your consultant uh, about that, we could see that some of the things that they were trying to get to relative to the planting. And, and we would agree with staff that, and your forester that, that that type of density would probably be too much in order to achieve a, a nice complement of, of the low vegetation in conjunction with the trees. But we also know that, that there's certainly, um, what we were proposing, our landscape consultant was proposing in there, um, probably wasn't achieving the goal that, that you're looking for, for your, where you're trying to achieve that that higher canopy cover in there. So we we don't we don't see a problem with our consultant taking a, taking another look at this and and preparing an alternate plan, looking at the at tree spacings of 18 to 20 feet, and to look at a, di a little bit different type of trees. If uh, if we haven't seen the report from from your forester, but if he has recommendations for tree types in there, that we can go over that with our consultant and and come up with what we think is a, a mitigation plan that probably will achieve that. I saw it when we started the hearing that that most of you have seen the site, made a site visit, so you've seen um, what we, we were trying to point out in in our um, impact evaluation and report there that. The majority of the site is just grasses, and in fact, they're not even native grasses. They're they're, they're invasive type grasses that have accumulated from this. It's probably over the time was used as some type of pasture or some other type of of activity. So they're not even they're not even native. So you have very few native species in any of this. But part of our plan was to go in and and to clean up this area get rid of the blackberries, try to remove as much of the invasive uh, plant materials as we could, even in the waterway, do that by hand and to get that cleaned up so that we could establish a, a vegetative material in there that would be more native in nature by planting the native plants and hopefully prov providing enough uh, density in there to to cho choke out and make sure that the invasive species didn't have a chance to come back in. The homeowners association that would be created there would there be specific um, maintenance instructions put in the homeowners association documents throughout this area such that it would 
spell out the types of maintenance that our landscape consultants think would be necessary and how often in order to try to maintain that area and keep the invasive species under control. And in, relative to the fence issue, I, I would agree this particular client, we are doing some other residential developments adjacent to wetlands and, and other sensitive areas uh, here in the valley. And um, we have proposed on those sites back to the agencies that were dealing with the with DSL and the Corps to, to do exactly what your, what your staff is suggesting to put in what I would consider a low profile chain link fence that, that's not slatted, that has to remain open. I'd, I would recommend 48 inches and that provides a good uh, avenue for people to control pets and small children, but yet provides a good visual um, connection to that area so that people don't do what you're what you're concerned about, which is pitch grass clippings and weeds and other stuff over their fence because they're out of sight. Um, we've seen that happen a lot, and we just don't do don't recommend that anymore where we're backing up to these more sensitive type of areas like this. And we think that that using a, a nice black powder coated chain link fence in there or a green vinyl coated chain link fence, both of those are ones that I have used in, in my in my living environment would provide a nice a, a nice barrier, but yet not be visually uh, intrusive to the people living there and, and would still provide the opportunity for people to see what's what's going on back there. Um, I'm looking at my notes that I've made as, as Mary was talking. Um, th 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 this is a very thorough staff report for a project of six lots. We don't. We probably don't see that type of a thorough staff report for projects that have that have 50 or 100 lots. So she's put a lot of energy into this, and and we can attest to that because uh, we've been working with your staff for quite a while in order to get here. Um, we, we really believe that, that what we'll, this alternative three is, th is the best one, providing the pedestrian access to the east. The, the nice thing about the larger piece of property to the east is that it does have frontage on Stanley Avenue, so it can, it can develop in the future for street and vehicular access if that's what it chooses to happen without having to come across that, this natural area, resource area, and get to 56th. And I think that to some extent that'll help in the overall traffic patterns as time goes on. The stub street abated to the west is, is necessary in order to provide the ability for that property to redevelop in the future and not have to provide force another connection out to railroad. So so everything the staff has 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 asked us to try to consider, um, we think that with their advice we've achieved with this plan. And, and we think we can make a nice addition here and still provide a, a, a good protection of your, of your natural resource area in, in keeping with what your, your, your development standards are trying to achieve. So we, we've reviewed this, the draft conditions the staff has put forward. We don't have any issues with the conditions. We don't have any issues with the things that Mary's talked about tonight relative to, to the condition about the fence and and recognizing that that there needs to be an a, uh, enhanced mitigation plan um, that that would go that would go back to staff um, if if it was reasonable for the commission to approve the project and, and allow staff and the forester to be able to review the mitigation plan, uh, we think we can do that. Um, but if if it's something that the commission feels that they that needs to come back to them. Uh, we understand that as well. So with that, I'd be happy to answer questions. I do I do note that there is a large oak tree, 30 some inch oak tree that sits down right up against railroad, kind of in the middle. And the way we have the street set up there on lot three, we are saving that oak tree. So that, that oak tree is gonna be retained down there. So that's that's one significant feature that, we, that we've been um, able to set out. So that won't be impacted by by this project, and, and in fact, there's there's very few other than the brush along the railroad. There's very very little um, vegetation, existing vegetation on this site, other than the grass that's going to be um, impacted by this project. Uh, 
you're muted, Chair Massey. Good point. Thank you, Mark. Um, do you have any other members of the applicant who wish to testify? I, I believe Jeff Bolton is another one of my uh, staff people here that's worked on this project, but I think he, he's okay letting me take okay. lead here. All right, you've got the keys to the car, Mark, okay? I, yeah, I guess so. Okay. I just unmuted Jeff in case he needed to speak. Okay, I think we're good. Um, any questions uh, for the applicant from the Planning Commission? I have some. Go ahead. Uh, so I'm I'm trying to look at your plant layout uh, that you submitted, and I cannot read any of the uh, common names of the trees. Uh, the four three. Well, I can't. I guess can't even really need it, read the number. Do you know what those three species of trees are that you have that are in there? And yes, I can answer that. So. <laughs> The T ones, if you can see, the T the T ones are proposed as a red alder, and the T twos are proposed as Oregon ash, and and the T threes that are that are shown in there, our landscape consultant proposed as Pacific dogwood. Is that a uh, specific uh, Pacific dogwood, or is that a variety type? Um, that you're going to go beyond what engineers usually deal with here. All right, that's all right. Uh, my, yeah, no, my guess, but my guess is that 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 that's a, he's picked a, a he's picked trees that are that are intended to be uh, native to the valley. I believe that's what he was we asked him to do. So I believe what he tried to do there. So okay, all right. That was my only question. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Uh, yeah, I was um, I was going to have a series of questions, but he systematically addressed all of them in um, his presentation. So I really wanted to extend a thank you for the level of detail that you went into in addressing, um, you know, just a, a lot of the points that you did, uh, especially with respect to the um, alternatives that were, um, you know, proposed, but um, you know, not uh, not provided any uh, site plans for. I, I appreciate you going into why those were not actually feasible. Um, and uh, that was really what my question centered around. And so um, thanks for going into that detail and, and thanks for calling out um, Mary for her uh, detailed report. I, I appreciate that as well. And Denny, Denny too. <laughs> well, you, you, you know, you, you, as applicants in our world, we, we oftentimes learn a lot as we work with staff. And unfortunately, we've, we've had a, lo a longer period of time to work with your staff on this project than, than might normally occur. And so we've got to learn a lot about what, what staff's go goals were. And they helped a lot to, um, to direct us in, in to where we are today. So they're, they're really the reason that, uh, that I know what to say because we've been talking about it and, and they've been pointing it out. So. That's, you got good people there. Okay, we agree. Yeah, we agree. Um, okay, so we're gonna open it up for a public testimony and there's uh, uh, several things I have to do before we do that, so bear with me. Um, all testimony and evidence must be directed toward the applicable substantive criteria. Failure to address a criterion or raise an issue with sufficient detail to allow the Planning Commission an adequate opportunity to respond to each issue preclude appeal to the city council based on that issue. Failure to raise constitutional or other issues related to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient detail to allow response precludes an action for damages in circuit court. Any party withstanding may appeal the decision of the planning commission to the city council. Persons withstanding are those who submit written comments or testify online by logging onto the planning commission Zoom meeting through the city calendar or the city website. Uh, I will recognize those persons who have um, used the raise hand feature in Zoom to indicate that they wish to testify. And once you are unmuted, please remember to state your name and address for the record that uh, they may be entered into the minutes. And if you testify, please remember to confine your remarks to the 
to the application and the relevant criteria to avoid repetition and irre irrelevant information. In addition, documents or evidence are provided by any party. Uh, the commission may have requested uh, allow a continuance or leave the record open to allow the parties a reasonable opportunity to respond. Any such continuance or extension may be subject to the limitations of the 120 day rule unless the continuance or extensions requested are agreed to uh, by the applicant. Uh, and in the public testimony, I'll uh, limit the public testimony to three minutes per uh, per applicant per uh, uh, participant. Uh, so I'll ask the staff if we received any correspondence on this matter other than those items included in the meeting packet. Uh, we received one request for verbal comment, and that's it. Okay. All right. Um, so at this point, I will uh, open uh, for testimony in support of the applicant. Uh, do we have anyone who wishes to speak in support of the application? Please raise your hand in the Zoom application. I see none. Uh, testimony of those opposed to the application. Please raise your hand in the Zoom application. Yeah, I'm not sure how the raised your hand works um, in terms of the uh, telephone callers calls yeah oh this yeah. is a telephone call not a zoom application so uh, let me just jump to what i know uh and i believe that we have um uh, uh christina coil on the line is that is that correct yeah christina cole okay and uh miss cole are you uh testifying in opposition to the application well, I don't know if I'm testifying. I know that um, it said that we could have verbal input, and I just had some concerns regarding 56th Avenue. Okay. So I don't know if they're necessarily appropriate at this time. Just well, well, we're we're uh, we're at the, uh, the opposition and neutral testimony position. So if you're somewhere in between, that's okay. So why don't you go ahead and and speak your speak your case. Well, it might be resolved, our concerns might be resolved depending upon what alternative route you go, but um, I have talked to a few people on 56th Avenue and <clears throat> um, it, the only concerns on this whole project were the opening up of 56 and and having that connection now all the way to Railroad Avenue. There would definitely be an impact that would occur 256 if that occurs. Um, so some of those are just that this, this community is very much a walking, biking, pet kind of friendly community. We walk in the streets. So if 56 is opened, um, we're gonna see an increase in car traffic and noise. Um, there would be safety issues for families and pets and everybody that, that walks and bikes through here. So I did, um, and also if people come up through 56, 56 is not a direct access route going northbound. We have streets on either side of us that are west and east, but we're not. You would have to go through neighborhoods to get to Stanley eventually. Um, so with, just with that in mind, um, depending on what the decision is made, is that if, um, if the option was to open Stanley, or excuse me, 56 to pads and bikes, and not cars, we would jump. Well, I'll also include little red wagons in that too, just to see if you guys are awake. Um, we, that I think would be a really nice route and, and a nice win-win situation for I think all the people on 56. And I know that that was an option that you might not have to make it car. You could just get by with pets and bikes and little red wagons. So that's just the sense of people along my street. Um, and I think lastly, it's, it's also sort of in compliance with the goals of SAFE, which is providing safe avenues for people that are disabled that want to walk or ride their bikes. So going with that alternative would just make us jump for joy. 
And that's it. See, I was brief and short, and I kept you awake. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Cole. Uh, could I ask you for one thing before we, we conclude uh, uh, your testimony? Sure. Could you give us uh, your address so that we can include that in the record? Absolutely. It's 12003 Southeast 56th Avenue. And of course, that's Milwaukee 97222. Thank you very much. I have a question for Ms. Cole, if, if yes. it's okay. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Cole, uh, thank you for your testimony uh, tonight, um, and I, I appreciate uh, your sentiments. Um, my uh, my understanding is we're you know, legally obligated to extend the streets um, to facilitate development for the site. And so my question for you is: Would it be um, uh, would it be at all um, palatable to you um, or your neighbors that you've spoken to if um, if street diverters were included in some part of the design so that there was um, kind of a disincentive to trying to uh, use the street for cut through traffic? Oh, I, I'm sure that would be, be very welcome. Um, absolutely. Okay. I think well, it's uh, just, you know, it's... I appreciate, I appreciate your sentiment. Yeah, absolutely. So thank, thank you for that. I was just curious what uh, your um, anecdotal feedback was on that possibility. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate. Any other questions? And thank you all. <laughs> no, I don't. No, okay. I'm, thank you for the time. Thank you for your uh, participating. Sorry we took so yeah. long getting to you. <laughs> Okay. You guys are very interesting, and I I learned a lot. So I'll continue this to see if there's any uh, testimony of those who are opposed to the application. I think uh, Miss Cole was the only one on the phone. Yes. We have one. No, I think it might be the same person. Yeah, I did see her. I, I did see that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we've got her, her testimony. Well, let me open it back up so I can just double check and ask her. Okay. Hey, Christina, are yeah. you, the, were you also the one that raised your hand here? Uh, yes. Okay, great. We just wanted to make sure we weren't um, skipping over somebody. Nope, not at all. Okay, perfect. Thanks again. And uh, I will also ask if there's anyone who wishes to offer neutral testimony. Okay, uh, at this point, I, I will ask uh, the applicants to see if they have any rebuttal to the comments from the public testimony. Okay, I hear none. So at this point, I will close the public testimony portion of this hearing. Um, um, Chair Massey, I, yes. I, I think we had both the, app, the applicants muted at that moment. So okay. we need to ask that question again. Okay. Mark, we wanted, to give, we wanted to give the applicants an opportunity to rebut any of the public testimony. So there really isn't, there really isn't anything to but, but I did want to share that we wouldn't have any problem working with public works to come up with some traffic calming elements to put into the street. If that's what, if that's what uh, everybody wanted to achieve, because we understand the concerns that Christina raised relative to cut through traffic in there. So I think we'll be enhancing pedestrian traffic with the construction of the new walkways and stuff in there, but, but we, we wouldn't have any objection to putting some traffic calming elements in there. Thank you, Mark. Can I? Can I add um, one thing before we close the hearing? Um, in the in the chat function, um, Steve Adams had noted that um, the stream extends um, through pipes past the school, even across Linwood. And we might also um, want to ask Steve about the traffic issues. Right now. Okay. We need to unmute Steve to answer that. Yeah. Okay. I've unmuted him if he wants to speak. Steve, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, 
traffic issue. I see that he wrote something. Let me look. He sent an email just a second ago, so maybe he is uh, not live on the on the screen here. Let me find that email real quick. Um, he said, with 56 just connecting to Beckman and Stanley, I don't see cut through traffic as a problem. I think people are already living on 56 will use this new road to get to and from railroad. Okay. Any other comments we should consider before I close the public hearing? Okay, the uh, public uh, testimony, um, public testimony portion of this hearing on S two zero one eight zero zero one Railroad Avenue subdivision is now closed. No further testimony can be taken unless the public hearing is reopened. Uh, is the commission ready for discussion? Yes. Yes. Who wants to go first? Commissioner Edge. All right. Um, so uh, basically going through, um, you know, the, the key issues, um, I ultimately feel like everything, you know, ended up being uh, adequately addressed, um, you know, given the, the compromised nature of the site, you know, that's a really constrained site. The natural resources on the site are constraining and further constraining when we do the remapping um, to, you know, show where the resources actually exist. Um, and so, you know, I was particularly interested in seeing if we could get development on the, only the west side of the street, but um, the lot side, the lot depth is just impractical and you'd end up getting the same amount of uh, encroachment, you know, by moving the street to make the lot steep enough. So I think that um, I, I really, again, I, I want to say that I really appreciate the detail that the applicant went into in, um, in his presentation uh, about that because um, it addressed the questions I had about the um, alternatives analyses and, uh, you know, did they go, did they go far enough? Um, I think with his, uh, you know, augmented, um, you know, information through uh, his testimony tonight that, um, you know, we see that it really is impractical to, you know, look to put all the development on the west side of the street. Um, you know, we, um, we do want to protect the natural resources on the site, even if they are, you know, substandard, but, um, you know, it's there's there's a balance, obviously, and so getting that extra, you know, getting that 25 foot buffer um, behind lots one through three, and uh, the pedestrian connection, and um, working with the uh, the arborists uh, and staff to come back, um, you know, with a proposal for the mitigation plan, I think is completely appropriate, and um, you know, and maybe even working with um, engineering to see. Uh, and the NDA to see if there's, uh, um, you know, a, a traffic diversion strategy that might be appropriate for this. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the applicant's willingness to uh, at least speak up and, you know, and say that they're they're willing to to work with the city on on these possible conditions. So, um, I I'm comfortable uh, moving this forward and uh, asking staff to come back with, um, you know, all of the the necessary findings and conditions. Um, for us to approve this, um, you know, with the uh, alternative three, um, I'm comfortable with that for sure. So, uh, again, thanks to everybody for the amount of detail that went into this and um, the presentation tonight. Um, getting all of, all of the questions answered, I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Edge. Any other commissioners? Go ahead. You talking to me? Yeah. So, all right, I want you guys to know how much of a nerd I am. In my office, I have two laminated maps of the city of Milwaukee with the street. So I had to grab one of them to be able to look to see how long 56 really is. Uh, I mean, it is literally a dead-end street, and nobody, uh, because the other two streets that it dead-ends to connect to Stanley, 
Nobody's going to use 56 as a cut through. My suggestion would be is not to ask for any diverters or anything. Um, and that for the walkability part is that uh, the um, the actual uh, uh, sidewalks that are going to be there and the connection for railroad is going to be a much better improvement than what they feel on 56 right now. I do like the 20 foot radius uh, tree uh, plan a lot better than I do like the 10 or the 927 and 115 trees. That seems absolutely ridiculous. Um, there is a thing in, in forestry that basically says the farther apart that you space the trees, uh, the, the quicker and faster they'll be able to grow. So if we want to achieve this 40 foot canopy with the right trees, um, they don't know how expensive Pacific dogwoods are, a real Pacific dogwood. So I don't know if that's really going to be the tree that they're going to want to plant. They are beautiful. Uh, the ashes are nice, the red alders. One thing I'd like to have the forester look like, uh, look at is the white oak. We know that that is very natural to that particular area. There is a white oak that is actually still there on site. So it's growable there. At least it's attainable. Um, I personally like uh, uh, an evergreen tree myself, uh, but ponderosa pines, just so that everybody knows the way that they grow in nature um, is that uh, they allow for very little shrubbery down below. They drop a lot of needles so that fire can come and burn through because that's how their cones reproduce. So if we're worried about dry weather and that kind of thing, um, maybe ponderosa pine isn't the best, uh, but uh, a dug fir or uh, maybe some sort of uh, uh, noble fir, uh, something else that gets a little bit bushier uh, would maybe be a better alternative. Sorry, I, I'm not trying to nerd tree out on anybody, but it's what I know. Um, I like alternative three. I think that is the, uh, I think that they've shown all the other alternative routes. I think the work that they have done makes a lot of sense. One condition that I would like to add is that on the wire fence, whether it be four, I would say that it should be from four foot to six foot tall, but that it also be colored. Uh, instead of just the plain wire, I like the idea of it being green or black or, I mean, I don't really even care if it's blue or whatever, but the color is a lot better, I guess. Uh, and that, I, and I think I've covered everything that I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Other commissioners, you have anything to add? Uh, go ahead. Commissioner Burns, you mind if I go? I don't mind if you go. Uh, I'm not having any history of this project prior, um, just being a new commissioner myself. Um, I, I felt comfortable with a 25 foot setback as others have. Um, my, my response was in looking at the expected or the required protection zone. This, the plan for option three, alternative three, still cuts in significantly on that zone. And I was questioning whether um, locating the protective area um, closer to that wetland as it exists and potentially removing that um, lot to the northeast in order to provide a wider area of protection that's more focused would be an alternative um, seven worth looking at um, so that you could um, protect an area most, most densely located at the uh, nearest to that wetland um, as an option. I felt like the all the other discussions have been positive, and I would I would agree with um, uh, actually was agree with the notion that because 56 that ends um, that really there's no need for the additional traffic calming, um, and that the improvements of the sidewalk as they are going to be a benefit to the neighbor, the neighborhood, and the neighbors. Um, so I'd be interested if anybody else felt like that um, approach 
might have some value or if, uh, if you all do truly feel like alternative three as it's presented is I'm sorry, Lauren. Could could you explain using lot uh, numbers on what you're talking? Are you talking about eliminating lot three and moving it somewhere, or just only having five? Or so it says eighty on my plan. That's am I? It's four hundred or four thousand four hundred and three square feet. Eighty. Right, I, think that's lot, I think that's lot one. Yeah, I. I Okay, one, yeah, that makes sense because I see that's going in order, but generally speaking, and maybe I'm not even allowed to do this, Denny, but I sketched it out. Um, just looking at locating as much of that um, habitat area and restoration around the wetland as possible. Could you show your map again? Yeah, is that okay, Denny? I don't know if you have to submit. Yeah, so eliminating, eliminating lot one. Yes, that's correct. It says 80 on my plan, so. Yes, no, no, I hear you. Wasn't that alternative four or something? No, no, that, that wasn't any of the alternatives that were analyzed. It, it could be perceived as the alternative that was suggested by ESA going down to five lots. Um, right, that's, that's what I inferred. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, for for what is required and and what that alternate alternative approach, removing lot one suggests, it it still it feels like a balance. And you would do you would propose uh, commissioner or vice chair uh, Luzel, you would propose that uh, elimination of lot one without moving the pedestrian path that's proposed. That's correct. Can we see um, the HCA map again? Is there any way that we can get that up on the screen? Yeah, the, the remapped version of it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one second. Those are my comments. I will leave it to Commissioner Burns. Um, I think the alternatives analysis is is adequate. I'm kind of intrigued by the five lot option, I, you know, as, as in the ESA report and Vice Chair Lusfeld suggested, but. Um, you know, this is a, a, a home that um, is needed and someone can live in. And I think a lot of attention has been put into the sensitivity has been put into the site design. And so I'm not inclined to um, request further analysis. I think the alternatives analysis in my mind has been adequate, even though the five lot alternative would be interesting. I, I, I don't think it's necessary given all that we've heard today and seen in the staff report. So I, I think for um, key issue A, the alternatives analysis in my mind is adequate. Um, the variance to the amount of the HCA mitigation, I'm, all, yeah, I'm getting the, the 20 foot tree spacing and updated mitigation plan will be sufficient for that in my mind. I'm comfortable with the lot variances um, for lot size and front and rear setbacks, um, considering the constrained site. 
Um, so I'm inclined to um, advance the staff recommendations to provide updated mitigation plan and um, provide a, a tentative approval with a, a plan to approve in May. Let me, uh, let me just uh, give you a little commentary. I, I thought it was very interesting um, when Ms. Cole talked about um, this is a neighborhood who likes to walk down the streets and um, I just want to, when I was visiting the site, um, I saw a, a family of um, three, you know, mom, dad, a baby in a carriage. Uh, they had, uh, I think, four dogs with them. You know, it, you know, this was not a small footprint uh, pedestrian operation here. And they were literally walking right down the street. And I think the neighbors, you know, based upon what I saw and what I heard from Ms. Cole is that, 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 you know, it's like other neighborhoods in Milwaukee that have dead ends or stub streets is that, you know, they, um, they have so little traffic that they feel, um, they feel safe uh, walking down the street. And so uh, I understand that the, that the addition of the sidewalks um, uh, is going to provide a lot of improvements, but I wouldn't discount um, you know, the goodwill and possibly real safety measures that, uh, that might occur to having some uh, traffic calming um, um, uh, uh, apparatus available. So that's just a, a, a one sample observation. Um, uh, the second thing that I, I wanted to bring up is that, um, uh, like all of you, I think a lot of good work has been put on this. I, I, I have a little bit of hesitation about providing a, a, um, a tentative approval because I think that there's, you know, just there's, um, there's a lot of things to be ferreted out here. And so I'm, I'm, I'm actually maybe just more comfortable with just doing a continuance because I don't want an expectation that, uh, well, we're going to get together and no matter what comes out, there's going to be an approval. So that's why, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about, uh, you know, a tentative approval. Chair Massey? Yes. May I ask you um, what approval criteria you think are not satisfied? Um, well, I just don't think that uh, based upon the discussion with the, that we just got from the commissioners that there's a, um, you know, sort of a universal acceptance because I think we've heard uh, 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 one proposal that uh, that uh, we go from six to five. Uh, so that, that's, uh, I, I think that the, uh, the issues of uh, uh, what is gonna be done with the uh, mitigation plans, the replannings is still an open question. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I think I'm like most of you, I, whatever the number was, you know, 13 wasn't good enough, but 185 is, you know, overkill and that kind of thing. And so uh, I, I guess I just think that there's some detail to be flushed out. Can I ask you a question? Yes. If the applicant was allowed to go forward with six lots, has there been any discussion about other mitigation or improvements to either um, stormwater retention or filter or um, other pedestrian improvements or um, just really anything that might help improve um, those kind of public ways or environmental conditions. Um, has that been discussed? Stormwater. Um, stormwater requirements um, for each house, they need to accommodate the stormwater on site. Um, and I can't recall exactly what was being proposed for stormwater runoff um, on the street. There, there's a in the in the very back of the of the proposal of uh, the. The city's response. There's like two pages of requirements, and one was to you know have a have a standard uh, um, um, 
street drain, you know, to, I believe it was to railroad, and then each one of the uh, houses had to have a dry well or similar uh, apparatus. I guess I'm asking if there's an opportunity to go over and beyond recognizing that lots one through three technically by reading the requirements shouldn't be there based on the HCA. Well, part of the question was those those three lots, um, it was whether the HCA, it's, it's like a, the HCA is there because of a very strict requirement about distance from water bodies, even in small intermittent streams. So the intermittent stream there is treated exactly the same way as we would be treating Johnson Creek or Kellogg Creek. And so it was just try, trying to balance these, all these different issues there. Um, uh, whether there is something, I mean, they are going to need to plant up that back 25 feet fairly densely to create a much better riparian zone all along there. Whether there is anything else one could do about up in the front is another question. They will be required to do street trees along the front. Um, but I'm not sure there are, uh, we weren't looking at extra water quality features along the front necessarily. Yeah, I mean, they would need to meet our existing stormwater design standards, which would be required for any new lot in general. Um, but I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm not an engineer, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, yeah, I get. I just again, I'm not looking for like baseline requirements. I'm looking for over and above. Right. Like what? Like how about uh, pervious uh, surface on the walking path? That's over the uh, natural resource area. Uh, that would be required anyway. Yeah. Oh, that's required. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Steve has any. Um... Uh, Steve is not um, on the call anymore, but he's still participating. He's still watching, and he's been. Um, He's emailed me a couple of times, and I've, I've, uh, the one time I read his email, he hasn't commented on this particular um, discussion. His, his uh, Surface computer went, the battery went dead, and that was the, the issue. But I think he's got a laptop without voice ability. Would that be something that we could have them talk about more okay. on the water um, next time, or? We could. Um, Steve says he's still there, so he's he's watching. If we have a specific question for him, I suppose we can ask it. And I, I mean, I, I guess the question is the storm drainage. Um, how would we deal with storm drainage on this site? So I, well, I think the real question is, is uh, do we continue the uh, hearing with uh, public comment uh, still on? And, uh, and then the direction would be, what are some of the alternatives um, uh, or what are the, what would be better improvements that could happen uh, for having six lots instead of five? Am, am I on that same page with everybody? Yes. I agree. I, I think I'm satisfied with what's proposed. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if anything that I'm going to hear uh, in public uh, testimony or uh, with alternatives is going to change my mind either, but uh, I think it's well worth exploring. I think Commissioner uh, or Vice uh, Chair uh, Lozevelt brings up a very good point, so we might as well explore it. we got to continue it until May 12th anyways, really. The, um... I'm, I'm happy receiving additional information. Um, I, I don't particularly see a pathway to denial, and so I think that we're right now just at the point of trying to tune conditions of approval. 
um, to make sure that you know all of the uh, criteria will be met by the resulting plan. So, um, you know, again, I think I'm I'm satisfied with what I've heard. That I think that we can get the conditions in place um, to you know to meet the intent of the code. Um, if we want to get additional information about stormwater preliminary plans uh, and or traffic calming measures and or um, you know tree mitigation. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely comfortable receiving additional information um, to help us, uh, you know, craft um, more appropriate or relevant conditions of approval. Um, but I think that's where we are with with this particular review at this point. Can um, can we ask? Um, I think what we will need to do is work with a consultant to respond back. Um, we need to find out kind of what the time frame, reasonable time frame is. Um, and I think we will need to leave the record open for additional testimony, given that there will be new information brought forward. So, um, so it won't be closing the hearing entirely, um, but we could, we could close the hearing and focus on those three items. The mitigation plan, uh, the stormwater issues, um, traffic calming, um, but I'm not sure. I, I don't know if you want to keep the issue open um, related to five lots versus six lots. Well, that was, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go back to co-chair Losbelt. I mean, that was that was the issue that she brought up. I mean, uh, how do you feel about that? I'd, I'd like to, I mean, it's, is there consensus among the group that you're interested in the potential of five lots? I'm hearing kind of a split that, that six, as proposed, six, is working for you and you're satisfied. I would like to hear about the other measures, potential measures. Uh, I think uh, on an economic basis alone, the six lots uh, make the 56 connection uh, actually viable and the five lots probably don't. It is the way that I'm, I'm looking at it right now. So I would probably be more inclined to have the six lots no matter no matter what. But if uh, but if you can get if we could find better improvements uh, in the system of that subdivision to allow for that six lot for the habitat conservation area uh, destruction, then I think it's justifiable. So that's, that's really where I am now too. I think that um, I think they have cleared the hurdles to show um, you know why six lots is um, permissible uh, or approvable, and um, the the question would be, uh, can we make the proposal better? Um, you know, with through the conditions of approval. Um, you know, and if we if we come up with a, a case for why it should be five instead of six, then you know that's that's fine. I'm you know I'm going to consider the evidence in the record, but um, I think they've so far I think they've cleared the hurdles um, that they need to to justify the sixth lot. And um, the question would be, um, are they doing enough mitigation, and is is the rest of the proposal well rounded enough to um, justify the impacts of five versus six? And I think that's certainly worth exploring um, if we want to leave the record open and, and receive more information on, on those subjects. Um, I'd be particularly interested in hearing from the NDA uh, about uh, traffic calming, you know, questions or measures or suggestions or ideas or, you know, whatever that they might want to contribute, um, giving them the opportunity to do that specifically, I, I think would be a good thing. Um, I'm just kind of curious and, and, you know, maybe it is that it's part of a dead end closed off street network that, um, you know, segment that just largely doesn't matter. But I, I think that going back and getting some information on that is, is you know, appropriate. So um, anyway, if we want to do, you know, that, if we want to leave the record open for, you know, a few of these things, I, I think it's, it's more than appropriate. Um, but uh, I just wanted to kind of state, you know, clarify where my position was based on what the evidence I've seen so far. Mr. Burns, you have anything to add? Nothing to add. Okay. 
So, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm in the, I, I feel like, uh, you know, the, the, I think this has been, you know, quite a challenge to fit, uh, you know, uh, six properties into, into these constraints. And so but I think they've spent a lot of, they've done a lot of good effort here. But again, I'm just trying to make this uh, uh, the best possible, you know, uh, application for the future homeowners and for the surrounding neighborhood and uh, and the natural habitat. And I think that uh, that that can be uh, uh, that can be improved. And so I'm 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 um, you know inclined to continue um, you know the hearing to to uh, to you know do some more betterment work and to you know, like we said here from the neighborhood a little bit more. Can um, can we ask? the um, consultant whether um, they'll, they would be able to respond by May 12th, which I think is going to be really difficult to do, um, or whether we should be shooting for a, a May 26th, is that the right date? Um, yeah, yeah, May 26th hearing. Can we allow Mark to speak, Mary? Yeah, yeah we can. Mark, did you get our questions? Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I think it will be difficult for us to put together a, a, a meaningful mitigation plan and have it for you in time to get to a packet where your meeting is two weeks. I mean, I'd love to do that, but I just, I think in order to get my consultant and, and for us to work with staff to get something together, I, it's probably going to take me a little bit longer than a week yeah to do and and um and i, I don't want to do a half-ass job i want you to i want you to get something that that where i've listened to what you had to say and where i can make sure that we've provided you a lot of good information here um i can also have my stormwater engineer that's in my staff that's worked on this look at making sure that we we provided you with with the 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 best environmentally sound storm drainage system for this site too so so i i can do those things but i, I just don't see how how i can do it justice and have it back to you in a week um what sort of uh time frame should we shoot for should we shoot for the may 26th or um that would mean we we really need something back in about around two weeks so we would have a little bit of time to review and put a staff report back out Th that we can do okay yeah i can do i just don't think i can do it by the time i mobilize my yeah. consult i just don't think i can do it a week but i can well, i could have stuff to you in two weeks okay that'd be good so if you're going to continue it you want to continue it to may 26. Uh, I'd be willing to entertain a, uh, a motion to continue the uh, hearing. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, continue the hearing for file uh, S-2018-001 to a date certain of May 26th. I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Commissioner Burns. I die. Okay, thank you. So, um, do the commissioners have uh, any other uh, business or updates they'd like to contribute? I hear none. Can I just say, nope. I just say one thing? Sure. Um, it seems like that the end is uh, getting near to this coronavirus thing, and I will be happy to see you all in person. But I just want to thank uh, everybody. I know tonight was a little clustery, but I want to thank everybody for really actually being able to still hold public meetings and engaging the public and to be able to do this uh, and that the city business does not stop. So thank you very much for all of the hard work on your guys' end. I really do appreciate it. We all really do appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I just want to, I think to add to that comment, I feel like uh, this, you know, what we're working through here also adds an opportunity for folks who wouldn't otherwise be able to physically attend, attend. And I think if EDI is an interest of this group and of the city, you should consider maintaining this as uh, the new normal, uh, pro providing this opportunity for homebound folks or physically unable or whatever the case might be. Uh, more is better in this case, my opinion. And I also like uh, joining this from my home, <laughs> seeing you when I can, but I also like the opportunity to get home Thank you. Um, do the commissioners have any other items for discussion? No, thank you. No. Uh, forecast for future meetings from the staff? Yeah, next week, or in two weeks, we have on, on the 12th, we have a, um, um, a hearing on Riverway Lane uh, related to uh, a um, a vacation rental, vacation rental on um, Riverway Lane. And then um, uh, a month out, we've got this one. That's all we've got on the calendar right now. Okay. Uh, I'll there are some other things cooking. I'm sorry? There are some other things out there that are going to eventually be before you, some, okay. some big ones. All right. Denny, why, why I have you here, can you answer the question, are you guys accepting applications or giving out permits or doing that kind of stuff? What's going on with the planning department and if you wanted to build a building? Oh yeah, all the time. Um, I mean, we have uh, uh, the building departments really, really active. We're doing reviews of, uh, uh, of uh, the plan review for building permits all the time. Um, I mean, it's not, We've got a, a couple of um, pre-applications coming up. So, I mean, things haven't stopped at all. Yeah, they just adjusted to all online yeah. in a short amount of time. <laughs> yeah, there's a, a pre, an online pre-application um, on Thursday for parking lot expansion at El Puente School. There's a another pre-app that's going to be coming up for a multifamily development um, in the Waverly area, Waverly Heights. So there's stuff, you know, it's likely you're going to have some stuff. We answered questions today about the um, hillside application. So I mean, things are, things are still coming. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I will still entertain her. Motion to adjourn. Uh, I'll move that we adjourn. Any second? I'll second it. All I right. thought maybe nobody wanted to second it. <laughs> so much fun on Zoom here. Okay. Uh, we wanted, we wanted to extend the meeting past 10 o'clock. That's oh, all. Oh, please. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good week. Bye. 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 Bye.